What's up, everybody, and welcome to a brand new live episode of the Hot Mic here on the Outlaw Nation channel. Woo! Have we got a good one for you all today? A lot going on in the world of entertainment for us as we wrap up the week and get you excited for your weekend. I am the Outlaw John Broca, joined as always by the insider, the man dropping scoops every day on his newsletter, Jeff Snyder. How are you? I'm good, Johnny Boy. What a show it's going to be today. <laughs> yeah, I am. Show it's going to be. It's going to be glorious. <laughs> There's a lot to discuss, a lot of unpredictable stuff that might happen on the show. Just letting you know, no, this one's going to be extra spicy, extra hot for sure, because there is a lot going on uh, from Warner Brothers earnings calls to. Tom Cruise news to uh, stuff going on with Joker Toots, some Harry Potter news, Game of Thrones. We got a lot going on here. Uh, and of course, we want to encourage you all to send in your stream labs and your super chats as we go along. We appreciate it madly. Uh, and uh, of course, we, you know, we've got the, uh, the stream, la- stream labs address pinned in the chats and description of the video right above Jeff's head as well. Send in your love today. It's Friday. Let's start off the weekend right. Send us a lot of love here. I already see a lot of super chats coming through. So can't wait to get to those. And talk about those as we go along here today as well. Um, all right, well let's uh, let's just kick things off here right off the bat, Jeff. Well, what are you feeling? What, what, what's what's up? What, what's up with you, man? What, what, what's going on with you? What do you want to talk about, my man? Well, uh, right, I'm not even on the mic right now. We got to let the computer <laughs> charge a little bit. Yeah, okay. You well, want to wait on that one? Shall we move to Tom Cruise story instead? Shall we start with that one instead? No, I think we should okay. definitely talk about this Blue Mountain State story. I'm happy yeah, let's to do it. Everybody through what just happened. I mean. You know, this morning I reached out to, uh, I got a tip about, you know, the Blue Mountain State reboot in the works. Yes. Gay TV, shopping it all over town. Lots of streamers interested. Alan Richson coming back. And, you know, I reach out to my Lionsgate go-to, my, the you know, the pu- publicity. He's like, ah, you know, that's TV. I handle film stuff. Let me push in touch with the TV people. So yeah. TV people. And listen, I don't really know this this poor girl. You know, she doesn't really know me. She doesn't know who she's talking to. She doesn't know how to handle me, right? There's certain publicists around town who have probably even stayed in power because they're the insider whisperers. And they know- <laughs> okay. The girl did not. Yeah. First, you get the whole, well, it's premature, mm-hmm. right? It's premature. It's, it's who knows if this is going to happen, if it's real, right? And you go, okay. I just let it be. I was going to run a story tonight, you know, put, keep, and, and I would have included a line saying the studio, you know, insider, studio insiders say, yeah, it's premature. It's too soon. Yeah. But obviously it's fucking true. I mean, right. if you're just- popping it around town and, and execs from other streamers, right, are fucking mm-hmm. taking meetings to hear this pitch and whatnot, then every, then people know about it. Yeah. So they play the whole premature thing, and then uh, then I get you know a call, which you can see in the middle of FYC. I take that call, right, everybody? Wow. Okay. And it's Lionsgate, and they're like, "Hey, did you get our email? Like, you know, where we said, you know, we'll, we'll there's someone else on it, and we'll we'll let you know uh, when you can go with it." Yeah. I text my my film guy back. I'm like, "What? In, like, when you let me go with it? Like, this is what is wrong with the whole fucking thing." Yeah. Right. This is a true piece of news. Now, obviously, Deadline's going to break it when it lands somewhere. As yeah, right. Of it course. Hulu or Netflix or wherever, or Amazon yeah. Prime, right? So my whole newsletter is about delivering pre-news. Mm-hmm. Giving you the scoop before the scoop. Right, right. right. And there, so, so I'm like, listen, I, I, this is the plan tonight. Like, I understand you're telling me it's premature. Like, you know, others have been holding, like you, you don't want it out there, but like, this is the lead story in the newsletter tonight. So this is going, I'm being transparent with you. This is what I'm told publicists want. Same yeah. thing with Netflix last week on the Jen Garner animal story. I gave you a heads up. I don't yeah. care if it's a two minute heads up, a 30 second heads up, a five second heads up. You got a fucking heads up. Okay. Before the news hit, that's all I owe you. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. These, so so they're like so I'm like listen you you do what you got to do I'm gonna do what I got to do if you have to leak it to if you have to do your job and call deadline right now and, and they can post it in ten minutes my newsletter's not gonna be ready in ten minutes right right so do what you got to do 
and she did it. And and it, you know what? Props to her. Like, yeah. you did your job. That is what the studio is paying you to do. Yeah. I get it. Uh, and I respect that, right? Uh, but I have a job to do as well. And now mm -hmm. that job, okay, I'll tell you what, 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 what just made my job easier. Oh. A lot easier. Okay. I don't got to call Lionsgate no more. <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm like, use your head here. Like, yeah. Is this worth it? Is this worth? I'm. I mean, cl clearly, I'm a psychopath. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Is this worth upsetting a psychopath? <laughs> is this Blue Mountain State story worth it? You could have said, Nelly, Snyder just called. He's going to run in his newsletter tonight. Like it's a little early. We'll give you something else. Right. Or you could have said, Snyder, you know, Nelly, we just screwed you. N Nelly, Nelly just posted. But you know what? We've got something else. Right. You gotta, you gotta have a make good ready. If you're gonna take out the lead item of my newsletter, give me something to replace it. This is part of the job, isn't it? Right. This yeah. is why I don't know who the fuck they hire for these corporate communications jobs. Like, if I was the corporate communications executive, I'd be a great one because yeah. I would keep all the trade reporters happy, and I'd be a great referee because mm -hmm. I've been there. Okay. Right. The people who they put in these fucking jobs, they're like, I, you know what? I, I'll stop there. Yeah, I'll stop there. You're probably be best. Yeah, for now. For now. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, the, the boss gets involved, and it's just like, you know, oh, let's go to lunch. You know, you know what? Lunch will smooth it all over. Right. You guys cost me subscribers. I don't know how many subscribers could have been one fucking mega fan of Blue Mountain State, right? Who's going to buy a yearly subscription? True. I had the drop on the Blue Mountain State fucking reboot. Mm -hmm. Money off my table. If Nelly loses a story or one of the trade reporters loses a story, their paycheck is the exact fucking same at the end yep. of the week. Yep. salary. Yep. So I'm fighting for my life. Yeah. I'm fighting for my livelihood. This is life or death for me. I explain this situation to Lionsgate. Do you think they gave a fuck? Not at all. So I'm going to tell you right now, I don't give a fuck about them. And when the news starts popping off and mm -hmm. they, go, they go, well, how come we didn't get a heads up on this? How come, you know, our executives are upset? You say, ah, well, you know what? I made the terrible mistake of fucking over Jeff Snyder on something so fucking trivial. Hmm. Enjoy your weekend, guys. Wow. Wow. So that's a very strong statement because, yeah, Deadline dropped this about an hour ago, the Blue Mountain State uh, news uh, there on the, on the on the as you said, Nelly did over there at Deadline, basically detailing that, that this is in motion. It hasn't landed anywhere. Odds are it's probably, it's probably going to Prime Video. Because Alan Richardson has a uh, uh, you know deal with them with Reacher and other things that he's done there, so it's a very strong possibility that that's where it's going to end up, as opposed to where it started. I think it was on Spike TV initially when it first came out. So, but this is let's let's set that aside for just a second, Jeff. Here, yes. Why would Alan Richardson do this? Coming off the success of Reacher two seasons, people are talking about him as Batman. Why? And he's not going to get it, obviously, but they're talking about it. And that's cachet in this town. So why, or that town rather, why would you go back to Blue Mountain State? What are you possibly going to do with that series that would make sense for you in the position that you're in to go back to? I don't understand. It wasn't like it was a, a gangbuster, like fucking Sopranos, you know, streaming, mad, uh, you know, great show it was certainly beloved, but it wasn't. I don't know. USA has got a bunch of shows like this. So well, what's the difference here? I think Alan Richardson would come back. You know, I don't think he'd be like the lead necessarily. I think it'd probably be like a next generation. Maybe he'd be some kind of football coach. I have no idea. He doesn't say he'd be the coach, right? I didn't yeah. watch a second of that show. Yeah. Um, and I don't know where it left his character. But yeah, I think he probably feels indebted to those showrunners, to the, the creators mm -hmm. of that show, right? They sort of mm -hmm. helped launch his career. That show, you know, gave him a career. Fair and point. if he can help them out, um, I imagine that he that he would now that he is, you know, a buddy, a budding movie star, as long as it, you know, works with the schedule and everything. Yeah, yeah. That show has been around for like 14 years, though. I don't know. It's just an interesting situation. Let's take a look at him coming back to this the thing. But so let's move back to what you were talking about. Yeah, this is something that I think maybe what's going on is, um, and of course, I don't play the game the way you do. I don't deal with publicists other than can they get me an interview or get me into a press line or whatever. That's the, the extent of what I deal with. But I know that this situation here, it seems like, and we've been talking about this, this idea that um, – publicists feel like they're the ones that are going to give you the information when they dole out the information, then you're allowed to run with it. And they don't seem to really know how to handle uh, at times people like you who are like, no, I've got my own sources. I don't need you to tell me what the truth is. 
I've got people who are going to tell me what the truth is here about what's going on. So I don't need you to approve it. So you have to understand that this is, I'm an entity you have to deal with. I'm not that person who is being fed information to be put up on a website, like a majority of trade people seem to be. So it's an interesting position that you put your, that you find yourself in, Jeff. Now, I mean, because I know you've always hustled and pushed hard to get, to make these connections, and always uh, broke this news and got access to this news, and have created a a loyal network of people who give you the news here. So it is it must be a bit surprising to see a situation like this pop up yet again as you're trying to break something here. Just some, something people like don't learn; they, they 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 don't learn, and they need to be taught lessons. Mm. You know. So, mm. so I'll tell you right now. Yeah. Should I tip this? Yeah. Mm, fuck it. I don't give a fuck. Okay. Um, tonight's newsletter, I'm announcing a new D DC project. Wow. We're not, we're not going to, it's not ready to go out. So I can't talk about it today on, on the show. Sorry. Okay. Jeff. I'm going to break a new DC project tonight. And why did I break? Why am I breaking that? Because I emailed on it like a week ago and never got a response. And so, it, 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 you know, you wake up this morning and you go, okay, I'm back from fucking Palm Springs. I'm ready to fucking work hard for the yeah. people who pay me their hard-earned money to read my newsletter to get exclusive fucking information. Yeah. You haven't answered all week. I don't care if it's true, false, fucking made up, fucking pulled out of my asshole. It's going up, on, it's going up tonight in the newsletter, I guess, I, unless I get a fucking response. Guess yeah, what know. happened, John? Guess what happened? What happened? What do you think happened? You got ignored? You got ghosted? No, John. I got a fucking response. Of course you, I did. From Lionsgate just now? No, from Warner, from DC. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was like, guys, it's been a week. Like, what the fuck? How long am I? I got to yeah. hear from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Good point. All right. Uh, so, go. yes. Um, it, it's just, it's it's wild the way that publicists and, and Fucking people just behave, you know. Yeah, and I and I'm the crazy one because I sent an insane email, <laughs> you know. But it's just it's, the whole fucking thing is hilarious. It's quite a structure. It's quite a structure. Well, we've got 400 of you joining us right now. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. We real we really appreciate it. We know you can go a million other places to have fun with and hang out and, and get information live on on YouTube. So we appreciate you all hanging out with us. Today. And thanks for those of you who were able to make the jump because we originally go live on Thursdays at 4 p.m. We had to move it for scheduling issues and what have you. So uh, we appreciate it even more. Um, and as we go along, remember the Streamlabs Super Chats are open. Thanks so much already to people who've sent stuff in. We'll definitely be reading them as we go along here on the show. But we should jump to this uh, first uh, topic here I wanted to talk about with you, Jeff. Tom Cruise. It's been reported here on Deadline that uh, Warner Brothers and Legendary Entertainment are in negotiations for an untitled Alejandro Iñárritu film here starring Tom Cruise. Be, this would be the first film that Iñárritu is doing that is English language since 2015's The Revenant. It's going to be produced and directed by him with a new script he co-wrote in 2023 with Sabina Berman, as well as Alexander Dinalides and Nicholas Giacobone, who is uh, who were his co-writers on, on uh, Birdman. Um, and this also marks the first, time, uh, first film for Cruise since he signed that deal with Warner Brothers. Um, and apparently Cruz heard that Inuritu was taking meetings with these A-list actors for his next movie, and he made it his mission to get a meeting with Inuritu. And it seems like this might be um where we're headed with Warner Brothers, uh um uh, 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 Zaslav, Deluca, and Abdi and Inuritu all coming together to make this movie. So what's your reactions to this? Does this surprise you? Does it seem like the right combination considering we got Michael Keaton and Birdman, another 1980s star? getting uh, revamped here. What do you think of this? Hello? Oh, you're on the phone? Oh, he's on the phone. Okay, okay. Looks like he's on the phone, y'all. <laughs> I didn't even notice because I was reading the information. So he's probably talking to somebody there. Anyway, um, yeah, I like this idea. Just to let you guys know, I'm a big fan of it. And uh, yeah, maybe Lionsgate's on the line or maybe DC's on the line. We shall see. But I like the idea of Tom Cruise being a part. Oh, Jeff also has a desk that was supposed to be delivered. They did not get they get there on time. But this is the game, y'all. Um, so, yeah, this idea that Tom Cruise is going to go and lead an Inuritu film, I love this idea. I mean, Inuritu getting so much out of DiCaprio for The Revenant, I mean, led him to the Oscar there, then getting so much out of Birdman uh, for Michael Keaton, which I thought was incredible, Emma Stone. So seeing the work he can do with someone like Tom Cruise, and you know, we know we've seen Tom Cruise in like Magnolia. Magnolia. We've seen Tom Cruise in a number of dramatic instances doing really great work. So would this possibly be another best actor nomination? Do you like this combo, Jeff? Are you off the phone? Are you good to go? What's the what's the deal there? No, those that was the desk people. I know I, I wish yeah. I could say, yeah, that was Lionsgate, and I fucking gave him a piece of my mind. 
No, you guys are supposed to have a desk delivered between one and four, right? They yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably a half hour before. <laughs> they just called me. They said, we'll be there in 10 minutes. I go, it's 420. I'm, yeah. I'm gone. I left. One to four. I'm out. Goodbye. Reschedule oh. delivery for Tuesday. Uh, you know, I just fucking, again, more people yeah. who give you their word. Yes, yes. Wait here from one to four. Yes. And then don't fucking show up. F- like, fuck these people. I hear you. I hear you. Absolutely, my man. Um, but, uh, all right. So we got that de- the desk on Tuesday. So the desk is going to be on Tuesday. So we got that scheduled. Um, uh, so what are your thoughts though on Tom Cruise and Ian Ritu coming together, man? What's your feeling on that? I think this is a great call for him, right? I mean, mm-hmm. obviously this has to do with him getting an Oscar. Yes. Even though he says he doesn't care about it. Uh, sure. Every- everybody fucking cares. Right? Yeah, exactly. He, he got Leo his Oscar. Yes, he did. He got close to getting Keaton his Oscar. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, he he knows how to get great performances out of leading men. Now, yeah. I, I have a feeling this will be like a big muscular kind of um, like action epic, but not like a, a dumb action movie. Mm-hmm. You know? Not just like a, a summer blockbuster, but something like The Revenant, yeah. right? That is in the Oscar conversation. I mean, if I'm Tom Cruise, that's the movie you're looking at where it's like, fuck, like that should have been me. Right. You know, um, this he, Leo's on the side of a horse, and and like, you know, this is the shit that Tom Cruise just does in the Mission Impossible movies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that that has a lot to do with it. Um, I always, like I said, when when the when the Cruise deal was announced, yeah. everyone's like, oh, he's gonna do Edge of Tomorrow. Like that's not <laughs> what he's going up to fucking Warner Brothers to go do. Now right. maybe he'll do that if they deliver his uh, him an Oscar right on this yeah, yeah. In, uh, Alejandro movie or whatever. But um, I don't think it, making sequels to movies, that, you know, that that were middle brow performers from a decade ago. I don't think that that is what he's looking to do up there. He's looking to tell original stories yeah. and stories that are meant to be seen on the big screen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you, don't you find it interesting that Tom made the move as soon as he heard that Inaritu was taking these meetings with A-list actors? Tom made sure he was one of the first people that Inaritu met with and then boom, they seem to have hit it off. It seems like, and uh, he's on board with the project. So do you think Inaritu had Tom Cruise in mind all along? Or do you think this was something like Tom Cruise, like oh. forcing himself into the door and then got the part? What do you it think? It sounded like he was meeting with A-list actors and then mm. Tom found out about yes. it. Um, and was like, Hey, you know, get me in there. And, and by the time the meeting was over, he was like, I'm fucking in. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that was, you know, before things were officially set up with Warner Brothers and Legendary, right? Because it right. said that they're in negotiations for that package. So, yeah. uh, but, you know, Alejandro's a CAA guy, I believe. So is Tom. So right. it's just, you know, agency putting, you know, it, it's star client crews in a room with one yeah. of its agency directors. I think it's also a great uh, situation for you, for, in, for Inuritu, rather. If you're Inuritu, like, you're like, well, how can I get the best budget? How can I make sure this thing's going to get the most profile and views on it i'll cast tom cruise who's the biggest movie star in the world that's a smart move i mean you don't get that with uh you don't get that with uh with michael keaton you do get that with uh with dicaprio but you're tell- also telling a very a time period story and so i'm going to be very curious to see where he's going to go with the tom cruise story is it going to be a futuristic film is it going to be a modern day film is it going to be a period film i got a lot of questions of where we're going to go with this one but i'm excited to see these two combine uh, to create something really fantastic I feel that I don't know, man. Like mm. it's not that sci like the Academy doesn't spark to sci-fi because obviously mm. everything everywhere qualifies as, as uh, sci-fi in that sure. one. Thing. But like I don't get the sense that futuristic is the way to go if you were chasing an Oscar. Okay. And I feel That's like he's point. a you know, I don't know, he feels like a kind of filmmaker who tells the story of like now and the present. Yeah. I'd be surprised if it was like a big futuristic sort of thing. Okay. All right. Well, you talk action. I was thinking maybe that could be that could be interesting. I'm doing best actor for like a sci-fi movie. Yeah. No, you're you know? right about that. You're absolutely right. Yeah. That or a comedy. It's really tough to do for sure. Um. All right. Well, let's uh let's move on to some other stuff here. Let's move, let's let's hit a big chunk of this WB stuff. You know, there was a earnings call that happened here with Zaslav and other members of the WB management team or executive team rather. Uh, and they, the reports are coming out that on today that uh, WB was saying that they generated 3.3 billion in free cash flow during the fourth quarter, ended the year with 6.2 billion in free cash, fat cash flow up 86% from the year prior. 
And yet there have been these comments that they're saying uh, online, talking about, you know, how they, they, they're, a, they're a story-based company. They're the best movie studio for story-based content, which I thought was kind of comical. Then we've got news that Zaslav was revealing that he's met with J.K. Rowling, and they're very excited about where they're going with the Harry Potter series. Um, and there's a news here about Game of Thrones as well, which is involved in all of this. So it seems like a lot is going down here. We've got a spinoff of Game of Thrones coming here in next year. So they're going to essentially be having a Game of Thrones series every year, it seems like, going forward. There's also another series that's possibly coming. So what do you take out of all of this? I mean, Zaslav has taken a lot of shit, but the stocks went down, even though he's saying he's got more cash flow. So is this all an illusion? And are all these deals being signed all, all of a sudden with Tom Cruise and other people to make Warner Brothers look attractive? Because in April is when they, they can either sell buy or merge with another company what are your thoughts on all of this i've definitely said that that is exactly what they're doing on the film side right mm. and they're doing the same thing as they did at mgm which is just overspend for a lot of projects you don't have to make them yeah, yeah. you just have to overspend to have them basically um and be able to say yeah we're we're, we're developing projects with so and so so and so so and so and so yeah yeah right i mean look at yeah, was MGM ever going to get like Project Hail Mary off the ground there? No, but it made it, you know, maybe look more attractive. Right. Um, when Amazon bought MGM, because it's like, okay, now we can make Project Hail Mary with Ryan. We just got a Ryan Gosling movie. Right. Amazon, right. You know? um, so, I mean, the free cash flow stuff is all about Zaslav padding his own bonus, right? Because that's mm -hmm. what the bonus is based on. All right. Ca uh, free cash. Yeah. You know, obviously, my. Yeah, they're they're doing Harry Potter, and and that's a priority, of course. Yeah. You know, another Game of Thrones. And uh, I mean, I here I thought no one was going to work with Warner Brothers again because they uh, <laughs> didn't want to release uh, Coyote vs. Acme. Who who knew? Um, but yeah, it was it, it yeah. was encouraging that the streaming is going well for them. Although it's de it's deceptive because they didn't really make anything last year, right? Yeah. Yeah. You just turn a profit when you're not spending a lot of money on production. Yeah, they reported a profit of 103 million compared with a loss of nearly 2.1 billion for all of 2022. Uh, they the profit was for 2023 there, so yeah, it, it, it's an excellent point. Yeah. Um. Yeah. What else? Uh, what else about that one? Well, just the what do you think? Because I mean, the, the stock park the stock prices went down. I was reading a CNBC article about this, and they're saying investors and people who monitor the stuff on Wall Street aren't necessarily believing warner brothers numbers believing warner brothers uh, uh and, and is moving in a positive direction which is why the stock price went down they, it, usually when you see a company uh, posting profits and got more cash flow and all of this going on the stock price would go up so it's a bit surprising to see it go down so as you said just a few minutes ago, or a few seconds ago is this all smoke and mirrors and there's still a lot of trouble here at warner brothers just before they become available for possibly purchase in april Sorry, I got a, a text. Um, uh, THR reporting that Vin Diesel is moving forward with the next fast installment. Oh, you know, a, after that, hold on, with a, with a lawsuit. Hold on. Would it be Fast Eleven? Um, fast Twelve. Yes, Fast Eleven. Okay. Yes. I don't know. Doesn't it? It's one of the, one of those like headlines that like makes you think. But yeah. Like, uh, then you read it closer, and it's like, eh, there's nothing really here. <laughs> oh, uh, yes. Back to Warner Brothers. I'm so sorry. You asked. Yeah, yeah. I was just asking. When you look at what, uh, when you look at the money they're making here, they claim to be making with all this free cash flow. They've made 103 million dollars of profit. Yet the stock price went down. And so I was reading the CNBC article, and it's basically detailing how the investors don't believe these numbers from Warner Brothers. Don't really buy into this, and seeing a little bit, seeing it that it's a little bit of smoke and mirrors does this bode is this an ominous sign for warner brothers like just a few weeks away from april like it, all the things that they're doing it's people are seeing through it as smoke and mirrors rather than seeing it as a company that looks attractive to purchase i mean i think it is a, a very attractive purchase still right mm -hmm. um but okay. I, yeah I, I definitely think that it's very clear that they are trying to make themselves look as pretty as they can, you know, for a sale. I don't know if it'll be as soon as April, but you know, it's kind of an open secret at this point that it sounds like Universal is going to be buying, acquiring, merging. I don't know what you know, however you want to phrase it, with yeah. Warner Brothers. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know what the leadership will will look like when it's all said and done. Of Zaslav, I mean, it seems like a lot of trouble to go through 
if you're yeah. Zaslav, if you're just going to like sell the company and then peace out, right? Like yeah. Yeah, years building up your media profile, I imagine he's going to want to stick around. Um, you know, I don't know if, what the deal is with, with, would be with Donna or Mike and Pam mm -hmm. and all that. Right, right. I mean, I think Donna, frankly, should take the dis like the Disney job when when Bob Iger leaves. Like, mm. he was super qualified to run that studio, and I don't love, you know, the internal people that they may be looking at to replace Iger. So, yeah, yeah. But that's all, you know, speculation and shit like that. <laughs> well, they've also announced the Harry Potter installment. For those of you who don't know, that was announced earlier today. That uh, they said this on the call that the Harry Potter TV series is targeted to hit max streaming service in 2026 um which seems like a long way away but maybe not so much because you've still got a cast you still got to write the scripts you've still got to uh, lock down the production team you got to lock down the uh, you got to scout the areas and then you got to set everything up to shoot it and hope it all goes well um so do you think 2026 is an ambitious year for them to have this ready by the first installment or do you think it's totally doable as we sit here in, at the end of fit we're near the end of february uh, of 2024 I think it's totally doable. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, I'm not, do they spend the rest of the year writing the script and, and getting things together so that, you know, top of next year they can start filming or maybe, you know, maybe by next summer. I don't, I don't know when in 2026 this is supposed to debut. Yeah. I yeah. imagine the second half. But. Yeah. I would imagine as well. Well, um, I do want to announce one thing. This oh, is... did you hear something about this Harry Potter project? Joe? I, yeah, I did hear something about this Harry Potter project. Now, let me say something right now. There have been some people who, and look, I've turned over a new leaf. I've said this already in other shows. I'm becoming more of a positive person, so I'm not going to be upset at people. Some people have been coming at me saying, Roka's rumors are bullshit. Look, the, 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 the inherent word is rumor, right? It's not, this is going to happen. It's rumor on some of the stuff that I've said before. Some people have, uh, have sources and they've, they've floated stuff out to me. So I just want to make it clear. Those are rumors that I'm hearing in the wind. I'm not saying this is going to happen. So people coming at me for that. I'm, I'm, I, I'm sorry you feel hurt by that. I'm sorry you don't believe or trust me, uh, but work on that within yourself and uh, you know we can find a happy medium somewhere. But here is something that I hear that is a little bit more than a rumor. What I'm hearing with the Harry Potter series, and I'm hearing this from a very, very good source. Uh, you can read into that as you wish, is that succession writer Francesca Gardner is going to be the showrunner for this series and for those of you who know she was one of the four people that they were mentioning here with martha hiller kathleen jordan tom moran and michael leslie as being in contention as going to jk rowling bending the knee pitching their ideas for the show and from what i'm hearing from a very good source is that francesca gardner who was i think the showrunner for the last two seasons of succession or one of the head eps uh, for the last two seasons of succession will be the showrunner for this Harry Potter series coming to Max for Warner Brothers. I love this idea on so many levels because she was awesome uh, as uh, running Succession, and I would be excited. And this tells me that they're going with a much more adult, darker-oriented approach to telling this story as opposed to the Chris Columbus approach, which was much more kid-oriented. I think we're getting a little bit more of the older approach to these young kids experiencing the things and the darkness that they experience here at the school, which has always been an element of these Harry Potter books. So um, what do you think about this? Uh, do you do you buy the Francesca Gardner, who was listed as one of the five, five finalists? Do you buy her as uh, being the showrunners? It's, does it pass your smell test, Jeff, is what I would say? I would say it would, John. I mean, Succession yeah. is obviously the biggest show that HBO slash Max, you know, whatever has had uh, yeah. the last couple of years. And it was an Emmy darling. Uh, ratings were good and all that. Um, and, and just a really smart level of writing. And it, it was a talent magnet, right? Yeah. So that, yeah. Inside of just like the regular family, like the series regulars, that that show got great guest stars. I mean, yeah. Yeah. you know, even to get like Alexander Skarsgård to come in or something. So um, very different you know, I mean, Succession couldn't be f further than Harry Potter, in, in a sense. <laughs> um, but maybe they have more in common. Uh, you know, I don't know them obviously as well as you do, John. Yeah, I think I think it does pass the smell test, though. If, if she delivered on that show, you know, that they yeah. would entrust her with their sort of golden property. Yeah, I mean, obviously Jesse Armstrong being the showrunner on the show, but she was she was the uh, consulting producer for seasons three and four of the series, arguably two of the best seasons of the series. So 
having her come aboard, I think it's it's time to make that next leap to be the showrunner of uh, of this series. So that's what I'm hearing from some very strong sources that that is who they're going to go with. And and I love this idea. Nothing against the other four writers, I think, are very accomplished in their own right, in their own way. But this one excites me a lot because if she can bring that succession vibe to this story. Uh, I think will be real interesting. The combo of the dark humor along with situational stuff that's going on. The um, the idea of this school being run by this guy, the uh, the soap opera aspects of it all. I think it's good a good person to choose to do this uh, overall. So yeah, I love it. Now I suppose at some point they'll be announcing it really soon. And then at some point we're going to start getting some cast casting in all of this, uh, Jeff. And I bet that's going to be an insane experience trying to find the right people to play those roles. That's going to be just like a feeding frenzy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, before we leave Warner Brothers, I want to ask you one last thing. Uh, they start shooting Superman Legacy uh, next week. And um, Zaslav was asked about this and he spoke about it. And he said, you know, he said that he's really optimistic about Superman Legacy. But he said, bottom line, the studio has really been underperforming, including at the end of the year where we had some real struggle. But we're very optimistic about this year. And it has given us the chance to have a lot of the upside in the next two years. So. Do you like that he's embracing or accepting the fact that they had a bit of a down year? Do you appreciate that he's saying that? Or is this a little bit more of just kind of, he needs to say it to kind of address it and move on past it. This, this is for what? Oh, well, for, most for, people, for, for, most for, people don't like to admit when they've gone wrong or when their studio is not doing well or when they, you know, I'm just saying, do you like that he admitted it, that it's, that it was underperforming their, their film side, the superhero stuff wasn't doing well. He's accepting that it didn't do well. And now, even though Aquaman ended with $430 million worldwide. Well, shit, you're investors. I mean, I, I do yeah. think that 2024 is the first sort of full year where he'll be able to put his, you know, vision, creative vision, long-term strategy, or whatever the fuck, if, if there is, you know, if Warner Brothers is even around in a few months. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, they, they are putting together a strong 2025 slate. Yeah. Um. And yeah, I mean, I, I want a guy who's going to be, who's realistic about things and, yeah. and not delusional and, and trying to, you know, turn flops into successes after the fact, like, right. you know, it, it. this shit didn't work. Um, yeah. And they're trying to change it. Yeah. I like that too. All right. Let's take a quick break. Uh, it's where the 30 minute mark on the other side, we'll get into some more stories here. Uh, for you all and answer some of your stream live super chats as well. So keep sending those in as we go along here and we'll be right back right after this. I think I spoke too soon, Jeff. Uh, there's still a couple more Warner Brothers aspects uh, or uh, elements to this story here. Let me get your question. Let me get your thoughts on this. Game of Thrones, um, it came out. Benioff and Weiss were interviewed here for the Wall Street Journal because they've got Three Body Problem coming out on Netflix very soon. And we know back in just a few weeks ago, they were talking to Hollywood Reporter and revealed some more news about their experiences with Game of Thrones. Well, they uh, revealed here, uh, they or they confirmed something that George R. R. Martin first mentioned back in 2020 that there was once a plan to end the game the original game of thrones series as a film trilogy designed to be theatrical releases instead of just another season of television uh when they when uh, the wall street journal asked them benioff and weiss why this didn't happen benioff said network executives were not interested in bringing thrones to the theaters he remembered being reminded that hbo stands for home box office and not away box office um, and th this was an issue with them, like when they were looking at it. And, and this is something that I thought was a little bit surprising, uh, to see them not want to go and put these in the theater and see what they can make, see what they can do with them. What do you think of all of this, Jeff? Do you think this is, uh, this was the right move in the end? Cause that season was much maligned and people hated it. Do you think, uh, that maybe it would have been better as a movie trilogy to kind of wrap up things at, in game of Thrones land? What are we talking about? <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. I'm not going to give you a whole buildup if you're not going to fucking pay attention. I, I'm telling you that right fucking now. You okay? lost me. I'm like, uh, what? Game of Thrones? Is that yes. what I don't watch Game of Thrones. I don't yeah, but do you think it would have But you know what a series is. You know what a successful series is. And when they're going into a final season, if the creators go, we wanted to release it as a trilogy in the movie theater instead of doing a final season on TV, you can give me an opinion whether that would have been smart or not, can't you? No, not not what in this case. Fuck? Not in this case. I, I have no fucking idea. I don't know what you're talking about. 
You you know what game? Oh, Jesus Christ! You know what Game of Thrones Next. is though. Did you say pass? Next. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um. All right. Uh. Let's see. Let's move on to Tyler Perry. Let's talk about this man. Tyler Perry has put a planned eight hundred million dollar expansion of his Atlanta, Georgia studio on hold after seeing the capabilities of OpenAI's new model Sora, which lets users create video images from text prompts. Uh, he said, quote, I'm being told that it can do all these things, which is, is one thing, but actually seeing the capabilities, it was mind-blowing. And then he admitted that he has used AI on his final two films, and now he's putting his studios on hold, the expanding this $800 million expansion, he's putting it on hold till he sees what AI can actually do and if it affects who he needs to hire or who he, do, who he doesn't need to hire. What do you think about this story? I think this is all about tax breaks. Really? How so? I believe that the city of Atlanta or whatever the fuck it was, like sort of subsidized a big portion of the Tyler Perry studios or whatever. He was getting like a ton of tax credits because he was creating so many jobs down there. Right. Yeah. So they financed like a big portion of that creation of that studio, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I, I think that his, tax credit or whatever it was expired in 2022. Mm -hmm. And so I think that him saying, we're not going to expand the studios. We're not going to do it in $800 million expansion is because that tax credit expired. And then yeah. yeah. his way of, set, of being like, you better bring that motherfucker back or else I'm, mm. I'm not going to spend this money here and we'll just do shit with AI. Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm oh. sure. Yeah. AI obviously has a bunch of cool, you know, capabilities, but like, yeah. yeah. Is that really like Tyler Perry's style? Like, yeah. obviously you want to make shit for as cheap as you can, but I, I, I do He's feel right. like Tyler Perry deep down is probably like a pretty good guy who wants to like give back to his community and create jobs and all that kind of stuff. He's just mm. like, you know, you got to meet me halfway and help me do it because – you know, I can't fucking pay for all this on my own. Well, I didn't think that he might be using it as a negotiation tactic. That's actually kind of interesting to see that he would do that. Huh. Okay. How's that for tired motherfuckers? Yeah. Now you paid, now you paid attention. It's amazing how you contribute when you pay attention. Game of Thrones, dude, you know, you know what I care about, what I don't care about. Fucking but it's, Thrones. it's irrelevant. You understand the concept of would it make sense for creators to make a trilogy? I didn't watch the show, so how would I know whether it makes sense to put a season or two? Would seasons? you be okay with the Sopranos final season being three fucking films? No, that sounds stupid as fuck. There we go. We have an opinion. That's all I'm getting at is, do you think that would have but been smart? Surprise, maybe that would make sense for get for for Game of Thrones. You know, I don't know because I didn't watch the show and don't care. Okay, all right. Anyway, all right. I'm alive, baby. <laughs> I think we're both alive at this point. Um. All right. So yeah. So we'll see. But I, look, you say he cares about people. Certainly, Tyler Perry gave some uh, sweet quotes about like I want to make sure it doesn't cost jobs or cost human beings their living or whatever. But this is the same guy who a lot of people in the industry have spoken about how he has taken advantage of non-union rules, non-union labor laws to work people, multiple jobs, shoot two films at the same time while they're on the set on the same day, the same person working on both films at the same time. And so I don't know that he necessarily cares that deeply about his people. I think he cares about making money. And I wonder if this open AI situation, him halting the expansion is because, hey, I can make this, I can make my films even cheaper now using less people but he's going to say things in the press that are like, well, I don't want people to lose their jobs. I don't want to, if you don't want to do that, then don't use AI. Doesn't that seem simple, Jeff? If you don't want to do it, don't use AI. Just set up the studios and hire people, fuck AI, and do things like you're supposed to do. Wouldn't that be the easiest route yes, rather than going in the press? Yes, it would, but AI is a tool, right? And within yeah. the subset of tool, it's a, or whatever, it's a tool for leverage. That's yeah. what you use it for. Right. You say, fucking give me the money that I'm asking for to, to expand and create more jobs and all this stuff or whatever, because if you don't, then all the jobs are just going to weigh I'm uh, going to go away and I'm going to get uh, AI. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't trust him is all I'm saying. Uh, and I never have. Um, all right. Let's move on to True Detective. Uh, it has been renewed for season five at HBO. Both of us loved uh, the current season four. I saw you tweet about it the other day. Uh, Isa Lopez doing a wonderful job with this season, in our opinion. Jodie Foster, Callie Reese, Callie Reese doing a wonderful uh, uh, performances there. So it's been renewed for season five, much to Nick Pizzolatto's uh, um, uh, chagrin. So what are your thoughts on this, Jeff? Uh, thrilled for, for Isa Lopez. I mean, 
you know, the numbers on Rotten Tomatoes and both rating, you know, ratings wise, mm. bore out that this was the biggest season ever. Now, 12.7 million across. Did Night Country months. benefit from hat from you know having the brand awareness that Nick Pot Pizzolatto created with True Detective? Absolutely. That's why it's called True Detective Night Country and not just fucking Night Country, right? right? right. If it was just called Night Country, the numbers wouldn't be as high as they are, right? Okay. Um. So, so you know, I think that's just logical. But uh, th- this was for me the most creatively satisfying season. Mm-hmm. I get that the finale may have been mixed, um, but I liked the supernatural direction that it went. Me too. And yeah, I just feel like Pizzolatto, you know, you can, you can say things in advance of the show to like distance yourself from it or whatever, but it was just like this relentless six week campaign. It felt like, and maybe granted the media plays that up. Right. But like, yeah, it it was just classless, um, Mm -hmm. pretty fucking classless. I thought, and uh, I don't think that executives in this town are going to forget it. Yeah, it was weird. Like he was liking um, posts that uh, were saying negative things about the show on Instagram, like on the Insta stories. He was liking some of these or he's reposting them, which I thought was poor form. And then he created a separate Instagram post for people to comment on it. Uh, a comment on it. He said, because please leave me, my wife and and my my, my family alone. It's like, Dude, you know the internet. You know how this fucking works. You're going to shoot your mouth off. Don't be upset if people are going to come at you defending a show that they're liking, as you said, Jeff, that is getting higher ratings than than any other season uh, of this series before and did really well. So for all the complaining that you've seen, it's actually a minority of the people who didn't like the the show because a majority of people watched it at high numbers. So, yeah, I just think it's a dumb move by him all around. And it it reeks of pettiness and being a little bitch. Like it really does for him writing these tough ass characters for him to whine about a female creator with two female leads doing a season of the show. He could have just let it be collected his paycheck, but him being such a bitch about it because they use a couple of references to the first season. And I saw some holier than now motherfuckers on online going crazy about it. I don't understand that kind of reaction. man. That's what happens when you create IP for a very, very tiny company called HBO. (laughs) <laughs> like I don't understand you. You know, like yeah, they're allowed to call back to the show that they paid for, right? Um, yes, right, one hundred percent. You don't own it. You don't own it. And, and and you know, like I said a couple weeks ago or a month ago, I looked into rumors that Magnificent Seven was not going to move forward at Amazon. Yeah. That's what Nick Petzolato has been working on. Right. That's because every streamer kind of wants its own Yellowstone or whatever the fuck. Um, but, and so Amazon denied it at the time. They said, you know, no, this is, you know, we're still moving ahead and everything. But after all this, it's just so easy for them to just wipe their hands of him and be like, you know what, even if they still want to do Magnificent Seven, unless yeah. the is like fucking brilliant, just fucking find somebody else. Go find uh, someone comparable to Issa Lopez and do something cool and, and, and have a, a female perspective on that. I would love that. That would a great fuck you. To Nick Pizzolatto would be to go and get a female. And all female so that would be fucking hilarious. <laughs> and, and make it a seven that's all women or combine <laughs> women with men. I think that would be fun. Here's awesome. what I will defend him on, though, Pizzolatto. Sure. sure. People call him a misogynist, right? Because he didn't like the season or what they were doing with it. That's yeah. bullshit. Yeah. Okay? You're not a misogynist because you don't like something a woman did. If, right, if you right. don't like anything that any women do, then you're a misogynist. Right, right. Like, I, I, I fucking hate that because obviously I've been called a misogynist, a, a homophobe, a fucking racist, all this stuff. And it's like, no, I just disagree with a gay person or a black person or whatever. Like, it doesn't make you an Easternism. I don't, I don't subscribe to that kind of shit. I don't think Pizzolatto is a misogynist. Well, don't you think Pizzolatto is being a fool to like talk shit about a show that Kyla Reese is in? Kyla Reese could punch his lights out for God's sakes. I just don't understand. That is awesome. Dude, dude Kyla Reese could punch a lot of lights out. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And she responded to Pizzolatto's comments. This is what she said on, on, on her um, on her social media. She said, uh, uh, it's a damn shame that he felt the need to say these things. But hey, quote, I guess if you don't have anything good to share, shit on others is the new wave, LOL. So uh, I thought that was a great response, to be honest with you. A classy response, for sure. Um, all right, uh, so uh, there we go for that. Um, let's move to another sh- story here. Oh, no, wait, what do you think is going to happen in, in season five, Jeff? Do you think we get two female leads again? Do you think we get go back to a male situation? What do you expect to see from 
Isa Lopez, if you were to guess, like in the wind right now, what you'd like to see from a season five? I mean, we still haven't had, you know, a guy and a girl. Mm. Seems kind of basic, like, yeah. you know. <laughs> it worked for Mayor of Easttown, right? With uh, Kate oh, yeah. Winslet and, and Evan Peters. But yeah, yeah, literally every season of True Detective, they have not uh, done that. Yeah. So um, I think that would be cool. And I think changing the setting, you know, yeah. I, honestly, might take it south of the border. Ooh. Oh shit! That would be great. One second, one second. It's the okay. desk. Uh, but run, run with that idea for a second. Okay, I love the idea of uh, south of the border. That would be interesting, right? Were you gonna? Would you do something in Mexico? Would you have a uh, American cop? Would you have a um, uh, a Mexican cop there doing stuff? Kind of like the bridge, right? You guys remember that uh, show from a few years ago? That was a remake, obviously. Of I think it was a Norwegian show or Dutch show. Um, uh, which I loved the British version of it, the tunnel um, uh, there with uh, Clements Posey uh, from Harry Potter uh, fame. But yeah, the bridge was um, uh, uh, Diana Kruger, Diana Kruger who played the American, even though she had a German accent. And uh, it, uh, it was a Damien Bashir playing the Mexican uh, investigator. So it could be something to, to see if they were to go down uh, south of the border or go all the way to South America, which would be interesting to see that as well with Isa Lopez and her connections. Uh, and her heritage there. So, yeah, I, I would love to see that. Um, uh, uh, American cop with a Mexican. Mexican. Cool. 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 Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, you know, I think just taking it out of, you know, if, if you're surrounded by ice, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Where would I want to see a, a season of True Detective? How about a murder in the rainforest? Ooh. Right. Down in South America. But then I'm like, um, this feels, this also feels like, not that Mexico is, is America, it feels like a, like a distinctly American show. Right. Right. Um, but with Issa Lopez, I mean, it could be interesting yeah, going yeah. south of the border. Oh, yeah. Adam, you never heard of the show uh, with Damian uh, Bashir? It's called The Bridge. It was on FX. It was, as I said, it was a remake of a remake of a remake of yeah, yeah. the original show. You know, it I wasn't that good of a show. I thought the British one was better. Than I agree. I, I didn't love The Bridge either. Yeah. Don't try to sell me a woman with a German accent as an American. That doesn't make any sense. Anyway, all right. Uh, let's move on to Ballerina. Uh, the John Wick spinoff film has been pushed. All these films getting pushed, Jeff. 2025 now, June 6th uh, of 2025. This one, that of course, stars Anna de Armas. This one being directed by uh, Len Weissman. Uh, and uh, apparently they've got to do some reshoots here. Uh, Chaz Tuchelski and uh, Basil Ewanik and Erica Lee at Thunder Road there are working closely with director Len Weissman on additional action sequences for the film. Brother, you get what you pay for. I mean, look, Len had a nice film in Underworld. But, I mean, it's been a law of diminishing returns with a lot of his projects ever since. Yeah. Getting him on Ballerina, I thought, was a bad idea. And Completely. the fact that they're having to do reshoots to push. What are your thoughts on all this? Completely agree. Yeah. I mean, uh, like, you know, pe people deserve a shot. People should, you know. And, and Len Weisman got a shot. <laughs> yes, right? Yes. Yeah. Like, I get that only so many people have experience directing movies of a certain budget level, but like, yeah. what did the, what do you see in this guy that makes you be like, yeah, our biggest franchise, we want to put the spinoff and, and the future of that franchise in this guy's hands. Like, yeah, it yeah. makes no sense. Now Chad's going to have to come in and reshoot clean up basically. Yeah. Clean up. I think it's a lot more than a fucking cleanup job. Yeah, fair, fair. I, think, I think they're basically like reshooting the whole fucking thing. I think. Yeah. Um. Yeah. At least that's what Ian McShane seems to have have indicated or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, this is just, and and we're seeing this more and more, and I don't know if it's because of like, if the strikes disrupted something or people mm. were watching to to get done before the strikes and so and now they have to go and, and clean up uh, all that mess but yeah it, it, it doesn't seem like the right way to make movies with uh, all this kind of like heavy reshoots yeah i mean i agree with you dude i mean you look at len weissman's resume it's a it's a t it's two t it's a bunch of tv shows from like 2012 on um and he had done total that to terrible total recall um a movie there that was the remake Live free or die hard. I, I can understand why people like it or don't like it. It's a fun movie, but Underworld was good. Underworld Evolution, not as good. And then the rest of the stuff is just really kind of up in the air. You know, it's not really strong stuff in music videos. So I, it's a, it was an odd choice from the beginning. No surprise that they're pushing it now. But in its place um, will be The Crow, which is coming out on June 7th. Dude, we're almost in March. 
I haven't seen one fucking trailer or teaser or anything for the crow yet they're going to drop this thing on june 7th you're a big crow fan jeff it's about to come out in 4k i hope you already pre-ordered your copy what are your thoughts on this nonsense obviously i'm the crow's biggest fan in the world <laughs> that's why i go to you i have no idea what to expect i have i mean the super there's a supernatural element right because i'm told that the villain has supernatural abilities yeah. whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. this new movie played by danny houston um that has me nervous. Yeah. I mean, I think Bill Skarsgård could make a good crow, certainly better than anyone else that we've seen besides Brandon Lee. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to remain optimistic for it. But yeah, like where if, you, if you're going to put out that announcement of like, you know, release date and you want to distract the conversation from ballerina, yeah. where is my image? Why can't, why am I still putting images of Brandon Lee on stories about a crow reboot that True. was shot like two years ago or something. Like, <laughs> what the fuck? Give me an image of him in the makeup. Although, actually, I hear he's not really in the makeup very much. That, oh, that, wow. that, could, be, that could be the problem. Okay. But, um, yeah. I, uh, I, I June 7th seems like an ambitious release date for that movie. <laughs> I was surprised it's coming out in the middle of summer like that. I, I would have thought like August. Like City of Angels, I believe, came out in yeah. August. Yeah. Um, and or or try to hit the crow anniversary in late May. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, I think with Deadpool there and everything. So, um, but, yeah. Yeah. I hope it's good. I don't know. We've got someone in the chat saying the Jade Michael here saying the crow is pretty decent. Supposedly, it's supposedly tested well. And he thinks we're going to be getting a teaser for the crow next week. But we'll Rupert see. Sanders is like a decent director. I know Rupert he Sanders? a lot of. Well, I mean, Snow White wasn't good. Right. But uh Sure. I thought his Ghost in the Shell movie wasn't as bad as everybody said. Listen, I'm going to say that I agree with you. Now, I get the complaints about, because that's my favorite anime, above Akira, Ghost in right. the Shell. Leave, leave the, the racial stuff aside. Right. The racial stuff aside, I, like it's been on Pluto TV nonstop for the last week, and I've caught myself watching 20 or 30 minutes of it, because I did watch the full thing like a couple of years ago, and I had to say, like, the racial stuff aside, this was not a bad directed film. I thought Scarlet was good. The story, the vibe, the energy of the noir aspect of it all, I thought he nailed it. But yes, you can't ignore the racial stuff when you're looking at it as a whole. But if you move it, I think you can actually appreciate the film being a little bit better than people are saying it was. So I agree with you, brother. Uh, and I'd like to see him do something interesting with The Crow if he, if he gets it right, you know? He has a you know a, an interesting visual style. Obviously, I want to know like what is the tone of this movie? Is it embracing like the goth sort of vibe that the first yeah. one had? Since that you know is a huge part of the original's appeal. Mm -hmm. um, very curious about it. Will I get to see it early a after the email I sent to Lionsgate today? <laughs> probably not. <laughs> probably not. I mean, uh, to be to be frank, I probably already should have seen it. I mean, uh, you should be soliciting well, me for an early quote or notes or something so. like that. But uh, yeah, I, I you know. All these publicists are working off the same playbook. The playbook has been around for fucking 20 or 30 years, and no one even <laughs> like can think of deviating from it. Yeah, that's a fair point. That's true. Um, let's hit one more story before we go to break, and then we'll start to answer all your stream labs and super chats. Um, Joker 2, man. Uh, Jeff, this has uh, been a big deal here. Um, it has been it revealed that the budget for Joker 2 was $200 million dollars. And the original, the first Joker movie was only sixty million dollars. Part of the two hundred million dollars is Joaquin Phoenix is getting twenty million to reprise his role. I'm sure Todd Phillips got himself a nice bag on this one as well. And Lady Gaga is getting twelve million dollars. I saw a lot of people getting upset about the budget for this movie. It is from the previous regime, not Zaslav Zaslav's regime, but like it's a if there's musical numbers in the movie. And your Warner Brothers, as we saw with Wonka, they're going to spend the money to make these musical numbers spectacles, spectacles, especially in a film that made a billion dollars. So do you think $200 million is too much for the budget? Do you think all the hoopla and uh, ringing of hands was, was merited when this was announced? I never understand that stuff. Like, why do you guys care? 
It costs you the same amount of money to go see the movie. Who cares if it costs three hundred million dollars or twenty million dollars or two billion dollars? It costs yeah. you twenty bucks. Yeah. So, like, leave that to I don't know the industry reporters. I I, I never understand fear around budgets. Is it your money? Like, yeah. who gives a shit? Um, two hundred seems high to me. Yeah. I don't yeah. know how accurate that uh, that is. Um, yeah. Where was that? For, that was in the Variety article. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, Bellany already came out and said that that twelve million dollar figure was closer to ten million. Oh, okay. For uh, Gaga, okay. which sort of calls into question the other numbers and everything. But um, right. I mean, if the first one costs sixty, which feels low, yeah. Um, obviously, Joaquin. I mean, he won Best Actor, so he's going to get a bump. Yes. Todd Phillips. Made a billion dollar movie out of something that no one was expecting a billion dollars from. No. Right? So he gets a bump. Absolutely. I mean, pretty much everybody involved gets a bump. Then you've got Gaga and her salary. And, and yeah. it's just like. And who knows if she's writing music or singing songs for the film, which you'll get, she'll get paid for as well. Like, what do you expect a movie like this to cost? I mean, yeah. and, and again, the first one grossed a billion dollars. So whether it's 100 or 200, they feel fine spending it. Right, right. Right, that they're not worried about um, making their money back. They, you know, sometimes you see sequels. Sometimes they go up. Yeah. Right? Or, you know, uh, like Dark Knight. Right. Yeah. Uh, high, much higher gross than Batman Begins. Sometimes they go down. Yeah. Like Jurassic World. That was the biggest, and then two and three. It's diminishing yeah. returns. It's yeah. all about how that first film is sort of received. Um. And where am I going with this? Well, I'm just gonna jump in then because you lost your way. But Deluca and Abdi. This is one of their first projects that they greenlit together this joker too and obviously you want to green light it after what happened with the first joker movie the fact you could even get a sequel which no one anticipated was going to happen when this movie first came out you're going to spend a little bit to make it happen and you want it to look good but the article goes on to question some of the decisions here when you're talking about being fiscally responsible they talk about the paul thomas anderson film which is greenlit at 115 million dollars even though it doesn't really, he hasn't really blown the doors off the box office. So you have to question that. And then you've got the, and apparently they're not pretty, they're not happy on the Mickey 17 film itself, which is why it's being dumped in January. So you and I, when we got that news on Tuesday and reacted to it, we reacted to it with like, Ooh, this is not a good idea. Or this doesn't bode well for the film. Clearly uh, it seems like from the article here, DeLuca and Abdi feel the same way about it, which is why they pushed it to January. So uh yeah, yeah clearly they, they weren't uh, parasite fans maybe i, I don't know um <laughs> that mickey 17 shift was yeah it was obviously it raised, it raised some eyebrows and then to see yeah. it backed up in print where they're like yeah they're not so keen on it like okay i guess we're lucky we're getting it at all and it's not getting <laughs> uh, for a tax write-off but you you yeah. obviously and i realize coyote versus acme is you know a james gunn production in, in many ways or a, you know a safford movie whatever yeah, um, yeah you can't do that with pattinson you can't dump a pattinson movie that's, yeah that's, that's, that's true that's right. no no yeah yeah um john cena is a different story he's not playing batman right <laughs> so um what, you know, I, what, what, I, what the point i was getting at though is like yeah. the budget went up on joker because i do think that in this case expectations are higher because of Gaga. That Gaga is yeah. going to bring an audience that did yes. not show up to the first Joker. Right. Right. And, and just like the curiosity factor is going to be so fucking high. Her is Harley Quinn. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, they're, they're fine spending an extra hundred million or whatever it is that they, yeah. you know, th then they spent on the first film because they think that the receipts are going to be even higher. What do you think about these other things that are mentioned in the article? What do you think about them picking up Maggie Gyllenhaal's Frankenstein film? which is set in the 1930s with Christian Bale and Jesse Buckley. Look, just having Christian Bale lead your film doesn't lead to box office. Shall I show you the pale blue eye and the numbers for that? Do you think, do you, do you think this is a, a, a mistake for them to do this? And uh, because it, according to the article, they're also like, they seem unwilling to push back on talent asks, um, even though they just did that with uh, Ryan Coogler and Michael B. Jordan with those negotiations. If they're they playing with house money, what do they give a shit? If, again, if they had to answer for these moves in three years, right? Oh, no, holy shit, I could lose my job in three years if I if I make the right. wrong decision today. But right. three years from now, it's going to be somebody else's fucking problem. I mean, none of them are going to be there. So they are spending like sailors. Like, what? why right. do they care? So they're kicking like climate change down the road because they don't have to deal with it right now is what you basically 100%. Saying. And why, you know, why wouldn't you like, 
I don't know because you want to leave a good track record. You want to be responsible. Don't you know? Doesn't that follow? Their, you? Listen, their track record, right, is yeah. about making good movies. Yeah. No one remember. No one's sitting here today, twenty five years later. Yeah, twenty five years later, right? Saying right. fucking Magnolia cost one hundred and twenty million dollars and only right, made right. forty million dollars. Like right. what a fucking flop! And because Magnolia was not a hit movie, right? Right. It wasn't. Yeah. But it's a fucking masterpiece that we're still talking about 25 it's years true. later. And that yeah. is what the Luke and MD are interested in. You know, mm -hmm. if they get, like, again, they just, it's not their money. What do they give a shit? Yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, all right. So there you go. That's uh, the stuff I wanted to hit on the main topics. Let's take a quick break. We'll get into your stream labs and super chats uh, and then wrap up the show uh, right after this. All right, Jeff, let's get into some of these uh, Streamlab Super Chats from our loyal uh, viewers here. Brandon Strelitz says, with the success of anyone but you, will we see a return of mid-range budget rom-coms to the big screen? And let me finish this question. Or was this an anomaly? It's a good question. Hmm. I think that you will see more rom-coms. Okay. But so much of like the success of that one was about casting. Mm. That is cat. That is all about casting the right two stars at just the right time. Yes, I think that the rom coms. I mean, they're you know they're very. There's only so many actors who are even capable of like having a moment like it's that. True. Right. It's true. Yeah. Um, I anticipate that what you're gonna see across the board, not just in rom coms, but like in other genres, is a return to high concept. Mm. Okay. Um, because it's like. I mean, that's not really like a high concept movie. It's like pretty basic. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I think you're going to see those kinds of like movies with like a big hook, a big commercial hook that, that sounds weird, but it's easily describable in one sentence because you can't just rely on, you know, the right casting chemistry every time. Yeah. Yeah. And there aren't that many that you could cast in there, actors that would necessarily translate to, a successful box office for a rom-com film. There aren't right. that many people are like as hot as Sydney Sweeney. I don't mean like hot in the physical sense, but just like mm -hmm. hot in terms of her career right now. Same with Glenn Powell. Like, yeah, yeah. Very few actors have that kind of moment, mm -hmm. um, and and it can all go wrong so quickly. Look at what's happening with Anna de Armas. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. She had so much heat, and then you choose the wrong movie, Ghosted. And, and then, you know, ballerina is a problem now. And it's just like her, she's not getting the big roles like she once was mm. because there's yeah. like this stink around her now. She chose for it. And Blonde, in retrospect, not a good movie. Tracer James 51 says, hi, guys. Just want to say how much I enjoy your show. Just lost my job due to a fire and your show really helps. Oh, sorry, Tracer. Well, what are you doing? Sending money, brother. Save your money. What the hell? But, you know, we appreciate it. But, yeah. Jeff, what do you want to say? I'm Facebook. very sorry. I know how dangerous fires can be. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Tracer James. I was eating some gummies. Um, I lot, you know, I know how absolutely ter terrifying and dev devastating a fire can be. Um, I hope that you didn't lose anything in that fire um, other, other than the job, you know, because you're going to get another job. Yeah. You know, get back on the horse, start sending out those resumes. If there's anything that we can do to amplify it, let me know. Yeah. That's right. Aliyah, aloha. Good to see you, Aliyah. Any truth to the rumor that Feige slash Marvel is being pressured by Sony to do Spider-Man 4 for a 2025 release and multiversal slash Sony versus street level slash Feige? Well, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, the street level versus bigger scope. But Jeff, do you hear that uh, Feige is being pressured by Sony? I mean, could Sony even be able to pressure Feige to put a film out before he's ready to put it out? I mean, I'm sure Sony wants a Spider-Man movie for 2025, right? It's yeah. not going to have... It's doing all this, the universe stuff this year, right? It's Venom 3. Yeah, yeah. Raven. Yeah. They did Madam Web. Yep. So you're not going to have any of that stuff next year. Yeah. Right? So yeah, they, they need a tentpole just like Universal was wise to like, shit, we need a fucking Jurassic movie for, for next summer because we need yeah. a tentpole. Yeah. So Sony's in the same boat. Uh, everybody's kind of rushing for everything these days. Um, yeah, I, I 
that's why I think it'll be a little bit smaller and mm. and dirty and, and street level, you know, that kind of thing. Cause it, it's yeah. just quicker to make than one of these huge, you know, Marvel movies. that's going to take two years. Yeah. I think you're right about that. Uh, Mike Joyce says, Jeff, I couldn't quite place it on FYC, but I realize now that you remind me of a teddy bear I had when I was a kid with Eddie the- Ruxpin. Guys, my brother gave, and I was, I'm so, you know what? You know, I'm really mad about this Blue Mountain State story. Yeah, please tell me why you're really mad. Dedicated to my brother, who's a big Blue Mountain State fan. Oh, I don't He gave me these overalls for my birthday. I thought they were ridiculous at first. And now I kind of love them. You can pull them off. You can pull off overalls. Respect. I mean, I'll tell you, I mean, what I could, they they look a lot better shirtless. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to do the podcast shirtless. Just a dude like in overalls with no (laughs) shirt on, fucking sweat, glistening. What are we? Are we gonna be? Are we gonna do calendars? Is that, that what we're doing sexy. next? The same. I look sexy in these fucking overalls. Oh my God. Uh, Kaiser says, "I said, what's up with the Silver Surfer casting? Still, Anya Taylor Joy had said Marvel's casting a male due to backlash. Is Bardem Bar, Bardem set in stone for Galactus? Well, first of all, well, sorry, sorry, Jeff, you address it. What do you want to say? Uh, no, I don't think Bardem is set in stone. I said that they were trying to figure out his. Ske- like, that's the thing. I, mean, I, say, I literally say they're trying to figure out his schedule with the F one movie. That he's yeah. he's the guy who they want, but they don't know if he's going to be available schedule wise, and then it right. just becomes you know." Um, uh, with with Silver Surfer, I would say no because I, I don't think it is Anya Taylor Joy because they're meeting with actresses. Yes, right? so right. you don't meet with actresses for a role you've already cast. Uh, right, right. I feel like that one is probably open. Yeah, and it, and, and there's no. It said Marvel's casting a male due to backlash. Don't believe that nonsense. That is that is that is nonsense being floated by the anti woke. People who need to get your money so that you watch their shows. Don't believe that nonsense. It's, who would it, okay? So Silver Surfer. Yeah. Who who do you cast if not on Taylor Joy? Because I have I have, a, I, have a, I have a theory. Not a theory, but a, actually we're gonna do a couple of theories for Fantastic okay. right now. But who do, who do you cast? Well, what are you what are you going for? Right? Are you going for someone who's life? I mean, yes. wasn't wasn't Daisy Edgar Jones in contention for uh, Lois Lane? Uh, or Supergirl, so uh, she's an interesting choice. She's a damn good actress. Coming off of Twisters, she's gonna yeah. pop. I like her. I mean, if Sydney Swinney hadn't been Madam Web, that would have been my number one choice. You want to take advantage of someone who is hot in terms of their career and also hot in terms of physicality, and put them in a role where they can really shine uh, in as a uh, compliment to the overall film. She'd have been perfect for that. Oh, what, what about you? What do you got for two? I'm thinking of an actress who used to do big movies and is now just kind of doing indies and stuff. Okay. Who would like kind of look great with like a, you know, if she shaved her head again and it's just all chrome and, and I don't know what kind of like commitment the fantastic, like the, the silver surfer requires, right? Is this mm-hmm. for multiple movies? Is this like a one-off? Yeah. But look, picture this. You ready? Take it, break it down. What if they went out and got Kristen Stewart? Oh, how funny you say that, Justin. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Mr. Ryan was Are saying you right me? Wow, he, got, he guessed it based on my description. <laughs> That's not a bad idea, actually. And, you know, she's she's obviously that Rolling Stone cover is getting a lot of heat on her. And she's got that movie coming out, which a lot of people are, seem to be saying is a damn good doesn't film. So a, a nice choice. Doesn't yeah. play a villain that often. Like, right. Has a certain, like, body type. Like, I don't know. I could see yeah. her being pretty interesting. Here's another know. one. Yeah, go ahead. Months ago, okay, there was there were stories that Marvel was meeting with a certain actor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I forget what the and and he was. We thought he was going to be in another movie, or maybe he already was. I forget who who right. played Balder. Was it Balder the Brave? Yeah, Balder the Brave. He was in which one? Uh, Balder the Brave was in. What are you talking? About? Was in Loki? What, what do you mean? No, Balder the Brave. That was Daniel Craig that they were looking at for Ball to the Brave, but then they didn't go along with it. Right. Okay. So he didn't play. He didn't play Ball to the Brave. No. You think of you thinking of Daniel Craig for Silver Surfer? You see no no no. You see where I'm going with this? No, I don't. Go ahead, take me there. Daniel Craig, right? If yeah. if they're talking to Daniel Craig and he's interested in doing a Marvel movie and they've got a fucking Big ass role in this movie. It's like a Rachel Vice. Is that what you're talking about? You're talking about Daniel Craig as Doctor Doom. Oh, what? What do you think of that? I love that idea. I love that idea. A thousand percent love that idea. 
that makes so much sense. You want to convey someone who's got that really kind of aggressive sexual chemistry, but also has the ability to be a pretty powerful villain because of what he's, we've seen him do in the James Bond films. I think that would be a, such an interesting choice to see him play Dr. Doom. The guy who's been Love playing the good guy for the yeah. last decade. Don't you want to, I don't know, embrace that inner villain? Um, yeah. I think this would kind of be the perfect time to do it. Uh, yeah, yeah. And again, not much required in this first film, but the, the, the role would grow. And yeah. you know, I, I think that that sounds good to me. Still Bill's on board. Still Bill's on board, apparently. So there you go. Oh, thanks for correcting me. You're right. Uh, uh, um, Rachel Weisz is already in the MCU, of course, in uh, the Black Widow movie. My bad. Um, but I, I love her, so put her in everything. Um, all right, let's see what else we got uh, here in these uh, stream labs. Owen Lanning says, uh, everyone on film Twitter loves to pile on WB, but I don't see a lot of people talking about the amount of talent they have acquired as of late. We haven't even seen movies from Abdi and DeLuca yet. Well, we're about to see Joker 2 here in a little bit, but yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, Jeff? Uh, do you think people are piling on a little too early before we see the results? Uh, yeah, they love having a villain. David Zaslav is you know, more than happy to be that villain, just like Truth. I'm more than happy to be the villain of entertainment journalism who haunts these executives' nightmares. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think they, they are making great choices. Uh, yeah. They're they're in, they're getting interesting projects. It's like we said. Okay, they're getting rid of fucking Scoob and Batgirl and Coyote yeah. versus Acme. What what was the trade? Cruz, Tarantino, and Margot Rob or Ryan Coogler. Like yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. These are deals that you make as a general yeah. manager of a movie studio, right? That's what we'll we'll call the role general manager GM. Yeah, and those are trades you make seven times out of seven. That's uh, it's not a bad way to look at it. I think you might be right there. Cody Hunt says, I'm absolutely pumped for Garth Edwards for Jurassic World. You can see influences of Parks in his body of work. Monster and Godzilla love his visual aesthetic. Yeah, we talked about this last time. Um, anything more you want to add to that or agree with anything Cody say? I was proud of the piece I wrote about Gareth Edwards. I wrote a piece on him earlier this week. Mm. Um, it just made a lot of sense. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. He, and, and he worked with that little girl on the creator. And I have yes. a feeling that if I'm Steven, yeah, I want to take this franchise back to being a franchise for kids. Ooh. Okay. This is a franchise for children. This is a fucking yeah. dinosaur thing. And I feel like, Oh, we got the original Jurassic park people back. Isn't this amazing? Fucking Sam Neill and Laura Dern. Okay. Well, kids don't know who the fuck these people are. Yeah, that's true. Right? They just no. don't care. No. So that is interesting to me, a 40 year old man, but yeah. 10-year-old Timmy doesn't give a shit. He wants yeah. to see himself like all of us do. With, you know, with, you know, they want to see themselves reflected on, on the screen. And, and I think you, like this franchise has lost its way in that regard, and, and it needs kids. So I have a feeling this is total speculation on my part, but like mm -hmm. I love the way Gareth Edwards directed that that little girl and, and the creator. So a good a good child performance. Yeah. Like I saw a photo of him directing her, and it's like this could be a photo of Steven Spielberg directing Drew Barrymore at seven yeah. years old uh, on the set of E.T. Uh, so it was just something that I think went under the radar in terms of the coverage. Um, I, I laid out a whole bunch of reasons, though. I think he's kind of perfect. Yeah, good point. Well, the OFC said, would love to know what you think of the body of a bodyguard remake. Maybe Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez or Dua Lipa and someone just would love to know your thoughts. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's been, what, three decades plus since the original. Whitney is sadly, uh, you know, been been uh, has passed on for quite some time. I think uh, the time has come that you could do that. You could even have a cameo from Costner, who is still working, which would be interesting in The Bodyguard. So, yeah, I'd be down with this. Not Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez, certainly not. But I think there's uh, other uh, actors and actresses out there that could be fun to seeing a film like uh, like the bodyguard what do you think there? i mean glenn a pop star who falls in love with a much kind of bigger tougher guy right yeah yeah you know anybody like that <laughs> you think travis kelsey and taylor swift the internet would explode would literally melt down if they announced travis kelsey and taylor swift in the bodyguard remake i'm telling you people would lose their shits whole youtube channels would pop up based on shitting on this for days, man, please. <laughs> and, oh, and I can see it happening. Rumor right now. Uh, no, I, I have not. I've not heard that. But um, 
I, I think that that would that's the kind of role. I, again, I have a piece. I'm working on a piece about it. Like that's the kind of role that if I'm Travis Kelsey, I'm looking for. If I really want like a career, and that's like on the high side, you'd have to like work your way up to that. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. movies and prove that you could, you know, that you're good on screen because the camera either likes you or it doesn't. Right. 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 You know. Um, yeah, I don't know about Kelsey as a movie star, and I do think that he'd be better off starting off with like sm smaller supporting henchmen type of roles. Like right. the bodyguard may be too big a leap too soon, but if I was a studio trying to make money, it seems yeah. like a good, good way to I go. Mean, you're not, if you can get the if you can get the fucking rights, I guess you it'd be a smart move for sure. I you mean, know without Kelsey, okay. Oh, fuck. Okay, I do have something cool. Uh, all right. Um, even without Kelsey, though, Taylor Swift and, and the idea of like the bodyguard would be interesting. I agree, hundred percent. I think that that's that's a lock uh, in terms of casting. I know people. I know you mentioned Dua Lipa, Wiley, but she didn't show us much in in Argyle there. So, I, I, but I the, Taylor Swift is how you guarantee money in the it, box office. Man, here is okay. I'm going to give away one of the projects that I think Kelsey should be looking at. Go ahead. Okay. Oh boy. Oh boy. Travis Kelsey's a football player, right? That he is. You know any football movies in the works? Where he can actually uh, act, you know? No, I just know Chad Powers is in the works with Glenn Powell playing uh, Eli Manning. That, that, that could be good, you know? <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. Uh, no, what What do you got? Who directed Amsterdam with Taylor Swift? Uh, oh, I forget. It crashed and burned that film. Who, who was it? David O. Russell. That's right. David O. Russell. Oh, yeah. God. I'm going to forget David O. fucking Russell. Go ahead. Yeah. And what's David O. Russell's new movie? I don't know, man. Just tell me. What the fuck? I don't have time for this. It's Friday. Go. It's about John Madden. Oh, interesting. So even though I think Kelsey should do like a comedy, like if he could get a role as like oh. a fucking football player in the Madden movie. Bro, he's John Matuzak right there. Boom. Game over. He that's, could be the twos. That's what I would do. Dude, that's a perfect cast for him to be John Matuzak. For those who don't remember, very big uh, personality on those Raiders teams under John Madden. John Matuzak would be a fantastic choice for Kelsey. I, I like that idea. Um, all right, let's keep going. We got a lot of these, man. We got a lot to get through here, Jeff. Um, uh, da, 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 da. It says Goopy G says, What's the point of reaching out to publicists? It seems like a lose lose because they either ignore you or feed it to the trades. Is it just etiquette? It is etiquette. I mean, you know, prior to today, I had a great relationship with Lionsgate because I respect its film publicist so mm. much, right? Mm. This is what happens when you wade into the world of television. Yeah. You know, uh, where Nelly Andreva deadline is the queen. Mm. You don't cross Nelly Andreva. <laughs> I didn't know that. Okay. You know what? Um, so <laughs> I reached out to publicists. Today was more of a heads up. It wasn't mm. really a question. Uh, right. It was interpreted as a question, and then, and that's why I got screwed. But yeah, um, I do it to maintain relationships, uh, and it is good etiquette. But you know, you you get what you give in this town, right? It, yeah. it is a yeah. quid pro quo game. That is why they are called trades. Variety deadline. <laughs> okay, that, that's why I've always like. Why is this called a trade? Because it's about a trade. Cra no, it's because they're trading. Yeah. Right. It's just a one trade. Give me information, you know, and, and you can buy an ad and all that shit. So, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll keep reaching out, but once they screw me or it's just like so blatantly, then it's like, okay, good luck. Cause I don't need any of these studios permission anymore. Unless you're going to buy an ad. Why should you have any semblance of control over me? Like my, my bosses are the readers. I want to keep the readers happy. And so I'm going to do whatever I can to keep the readers happy. And I'm sorry if it pisses off studios going forward. Next time, don't fuck me over. I gave you the opportunity. They could have, you know, they could have handled things a lot differently. I was a stand-up guy by being very transparent with my plan. I'm saying I called my shot. I said, if you want to blow it up, they, you can. They did. Yep. And now they'll, they'll suffer the consequences. Wait until what, you see what I break tonight. There you go. A lot cooler than the fucking Blue Mountain State reboot. I assure you that. And... You know, yeah, and you know, it's just like Nelly. You, you can run that, but you're just going to be screwing over your your film reporters because mm. now I'm going to get them on the film side. It's all one big fucking cluster. Mm. All right, Brandon says, well, "What's up, guys? After watching the Super Bowl trailers, it made me think what and when we will get a film from Jordan Peele again. Hoping he can find a new idea and keep pushing the black horror genre." 
Yeah, Jeff, uh, Jeff you hear anything on uh, on uh, Jordan Peele there? 2025. That's all I know. I believe that they uh, pushed it officially to 2025. I think it was on Monkey Pod's website. And, um, you know, obviously I'm down for another genre movie from him, but I also don't want him to feel like he has to, because he's Jordan Peele, go out and make a black horror genre movie. Yeah. Like, you know, that's feel free to upend expectations. Make a movie with a white movie star if that, you yeah. know, it, it's the character better. I don't know. Yeah, good point. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, all right. Neilio says, I love the positive, love the positivity, Mr. Outlaw. You demand. Thank you. You're not so bad either, Jeff. There you go. <laughs> love the show from Neil and Casey. Thank you, Neil. Appreciate it. Thanks. I appreciate that. Honestly. Now and again, production says any thoughts about Glenn Powell's new Hulu football comedy with Waldron a bit surprised he would take on a half hour Hulu comedy, but it sounds decent. Yeah, Jeff. I mean, does it make sense for Glenn Powell to take this on now as his star is ascending on the theatrical side of things? Um, I was a little surprised myself, mm. but what's the thing that, what's the thing that is most important to these people that is in none of the announcements ever, usually? Uh, money. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, John. You know, so I think it's just that they probably threw a ton of money at this guy. He may not even be making this much on the big screen, right? Because Twisters may have been like, all right, this is like a big guaranteed blockbuster hit. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. have any young guy in this like you know we're going to offer five hundred thousand or a million and, and you're take it or leave it kind of thing right um so i bet that hulu paid some sort of premium to keep him off the big screen for however long Ooh. it's worth, you know take him to, to shoot this and the other thing for him is that what if it's good what if this is like the next ted lasso mm. right yeah how do you turn how do you walk away from that just because it's a tv show it's a good point it's a good point yeah yeah all right uh brett staven says love the show about 25 percent of wbd income comes from ads from cable which is in rough shape not an expert but that could be the main reason stock went down i like where their movie slash show slate is heading though yeah that's true that's absolutely true and when you look at the overall I, I didn't think we had time and i'd lost jeff already just uh, two two lines into that so i didn't think we had time to go and break down everything uh going on financially with wb but certainly that's an element of it that you have to factor in when you're looking at the project or the uh, uh the studio as a whole and, and how it's doing financially so i appreciate that everybody's hurting even the streamers are hurting why do you think amazon started charging people uh you know or having ads right mm. Yeah, 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 good point. Charging people three bucks to, to avoid them. I mean, that's true. Uh, Adit Maud says, with the announcement of Daniel Dustin Cretton writing directly a Naruto movie, does this push Shang Chi two up uh, to be made? What do you think, Jeff? This just came out today that he's working on this Naruto Naruto movie. Yeah, I don't really know anything about Naruto or it's an anime. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know how it would affect the timetable for Shang Chi two or what that timetable even is right now. I, I yeah. again, I was always under the impression that like that Kang Dynasty movie, which we found out officially won't be called the Kang Dynasty. They yeah. finally came around and confirmed that because it was. I mean, how many, how many times did I say on this show? There's no fucking way Kang is going to be in the title. Yeah, so he conjures the idea of Jonathan Majors. That finally got confirmed, but um, yeah. I, I was always under the impression that the Kang Dynasty basically was Shang Chi too. Oh, interesting. That's okay, Shang -Chi, the, the Shang Chi, the hero, was going to have a huge part in that movie. Right, right. Good point. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see what else we got here. Sean Nicholson says, "What's next for Spielberg? Is it still his remake of Bullet, or does he have something new up his sleeve?" Jeff, what are you, what are you hearing? Um, I it's not Bullet. I don't know. I don't know what is going to be next. I don't know what's going to be next for, for Steve, Steve Arino. Um, yeah. I mean, what would you like to see him do? That's a good question. That's a very good question. Uh, I don't know what I'd like to see. Uh, a sci-fi film. Let's. Do, it's been a while. Do a sci-fi film. Uh, I'd be down with that. I definitely, I mean, I would like to see him do a horror movie, right? If, you, if, you, if Giamatti wants to do a horror movie and Nolan wants to do a yeah, horror yeah. movie, I just... I don't know. I feel like horror is in the air and, and Spielberg could do a great one. What, a, what about a comedy movie, man? He has never been successful at it. Maybe finally climbing that comedy mountain and delivering a straight up super funny comedy could be one final one final uh, um, uh, bus to hang on his wall, so to speak, man. No. Just throwing it out there. Empire Fan 1980 says, I watched an old movie from the from 1958 called A Night to Remember. Yeah, it's Titanic. 
Have you seen it? It's almost pretty accurate to the night of the Titanic sinking. Yeah, of course I've seen it. It's a fucking Criterion collection. These are the movies I grew up on, not Jeff. Me, I grew I, up on these black and white. I was say, John was an extra in that movie <laughs> in 1958. I have not seen it. You look like you're still in 1958 with those fucking overalls. Uh, all right, let's BFABM yes. says, do you know how much directors make on big MCU films? So I, I, it all depends on which which director and what film, right? And what series. Okay, cool now? <laughs> no, it was better with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Someone was asking where your um, where your coins and your mushrooms were. Um, <laughs> 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 So, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, Brandon says, yo, wouldn't it be cool if WB challenged themselves and made three Batman films with all three debuting the same weekend? Why the f what? With three challenge debuts? yourself, WB. <laughs> challenge yourself. What's wrong, Brandon? No studio would execute itself. It just doesn't make sense in any way, shape, or form, man. Uh, but I guess it would be funny if they did it, but you know that the, the fucking Nero is in charge of the, of the studio at that point, watching it burn. I hope um, everyone's getting, you know, get the yucks in. Get the yucks in. Is Jeff auditioning for Tucker and Dale versus Evil? I just got one, a, a text. Dude, you look like you're about to sell some moonshine. Because <laughs> uh, Earl had to die. John Lee said, did you guys see the Gladiator 2 budget is close to $310 million? That is a lie. The bu That budget seems insane to me. The first one made $460 million worldwide box office. How do these rumors spread? Dude? Like, it, 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 do they come from a credible place and then people just grab it and run with it? Three, there's no studio spending $310 million on a Gladiator 2 movie, for God's sakes. Come on, Jeff. Who knows who to believe? <laughs> who knows anymore? Um... What I'll say is the people on that article, it was not, it was not Boris. It was not Kim. Right. Right. Like that's the thing guys. Yeah. It's the Hollywood reporter, but like every reporter has different sources and abilities right. and all that kind of stuff. So this wasn't really from the top reporters over there necessarily not to denigrate whose bylines were on it, no, no. Um, but I mean, there, then there was a line in it that was like the studio says it's not more than two fifty. Is that was that a line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Say that I forget what the wording was specifically though. It's not more than two fifty, or that it's less than two fifty. Mm -hmm. Um, but e either way, it wasn't a great sign because any time a studio is mentioning any kind of number, it's a lie. Yeah, and it's yeah, under sure. what the, and it's under what the number is. Yeah. yeah. So if they're saying two fifty. <laughs> it may very well be 310. Uh, I do think that that movie was like, got screwed by the strike, right? Because he yeah. they it shut down. I think THR said it, it added 10 million to the budget just on the shutdowns and stuff. But I mean, Denzel is not cutting his quote for that. Like he doesn't come cheap. Ridley's not coming cheap, right? Gladiator sequel. I mean, you probably had to pay John Logan. Uh, yeah. or, no, no, no. Who wrote the sequel for this? I think it was David Scarpa. Okay. Um, yeah, a lot of lot of talent in this movie. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't cheap. I'm sure yeah. it wasn't cheap. <laughs> yep. I'm reading Ryan Scott over here on Slash Film, and he's uh, speculating about it because the source is Hollywood Reporter uh, said that it was close to 310 million. And yeah, the uh, the sources on that are Samuel Braslow, Kevin Dalek, and Julian Sancton. Those those were the writers of that. Um, uh, but yes, that what they said in the uh, in the article that it's Paramount sources dispute the figure, saying that it was under 250 million. Under 250 million. That's what they're saying. It was under 250 million. And it was all in, though, right? What was the yeah. other words there? And, I, and Ryan Scott said, but when you're in a position to argue that $250 million budget is a good thing, it's a dire situation. And if we assume the uh, Paramount is relatively thrifting with the marketing, there's no chance of marketing a movie of this size for less than $100 million, which would bring the total investment in this film to $400 million. That means the sequel would have to earn at least $800 million at the global box office just to have a shot at breaking even. So I agree, dude, because you don't even have a star like Russell Crowe's status as the lead of Gladiator 2. And don't give me Denzel. Denzel ain't putting a billion dollars of butts in seats anymore. This is not, or Mescal isn't either. So to me, this is a madness that you would spend this much on a film like this. Unless you're trying to win an Oscar, then I guess it's okay. And like, I think that it is. It, I think it is Paramount's awards pony, right? <sighs> Um, a sequel. Fuck out of here. That's crazy. Crazy thoughts. Crazy thoughts, in my opinion. 
it yeah listen it's definitely high it's it's definitely worrisome but yeah this is their big gamble this year i don't know it kind of kind of makes sense <laughs> okay empire band 19 says after 23 years disney movie club is ending disney must be in a bad spot <laughs> No, they just don't want to exploit kids anymore. Uh, Cowboys fan 92 says, Hi, guys. Even though Warner never said yes to the Batman Beyond animated film, do you think they will shop it around to other studios? And do you think David Zaslav has a bias towards animation? I, I wouldn't even be able to speculate on whether Zaslav has a bias here. Um, but, um, yeah, they should have made that Batman Beyond, but clearly Warner Brothers doesn't see animation as a feature film type of thing. They have great animated films they do from their Warner Brothers, uh, from the DC characters, rather, for their streaming services or straight to DVD or straight to Blu-ray, rather. But they don't see them necessarily as theatrical, even though Mask of the Phantasm is considered one of the best animated films ever made. So um, what do you think about this, Joe? Any chance we see a Batman Beyond uh, animated film? I have no idea, but um, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to yell at me for this. But okay. Cowboys fan 92, if you want this question really answered... <laughs> buy a subscription to the newsletter for 9.99 take that 10 bucks you just sent 9.99 to the newsletter and you know what <laughs> you know what stop taking money out of my mouth or we're going to start to have real problems bucky the ba buck teeth bandit said anything about bam bam part two love the show jeff and john have you heard anything about bam bam part two no okay Cowboys fan is the thoughts on the Writers Guild Awards. He's already, no one's taking money out of your pocket, Johnny. Thoughts on the Writers Guild Awards being exclusively on Netflix. The Writers? I think it's the Actors Guild. Yeah, it's right? SAG. It's SAG that's being exclusively on Netflix, um, which will be this weekend. Uh, uh, I don't care. Not not going to watch. Like, who watches these like these shows? How dare you? How dare you? I watch SAG. Every Are you going to watch the SAG Awards? Of course, I'm a actor. Of course, I'm going to watch the SAG Awards. I used to work the SAG Awards. I'm gonna years. fucking read the winners on Variety, just like everybody else, and mm -hmm. like go about the rest of my day. Like, I might do a live watch along, get some views. Um, Brandon says, "Can anyone remake movies like ET or Goonies, or are those movies just off limits?" Yeah, I think there are certain movies that are off limits, right, Jeff? There are certain movies that you can't. No one's gonna remake The Godfather or Citizen Kane or ET. Or I mean, you can remake The Goonies because I don't think that's a good movie, so I have no problem with the remake of that. But you'd have a hard time trying to impress upon. Trying to improve Steven Spielberg, even though he ironically remade West Side Story. Yeah, I was gonna say nobody does anything in this. You don't remake movies like that without Steven's permission. God, well, <laughs> when he goes, True. I mean, That's not cool. knock on wood uh, that he's with us for a lot, lot longer. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when he goes, Jesus Christ, I, I shudder to think of what Hollywood is going to do. Um, I don't think anything's going on with ET. Goonies, I could, I mean, I, you know, you hear whispers every now and then about Goonies and like the next generation. And I, I think that that would actually be a decent play for, yeah. for Warner Brothers, but uh, they would need Steven sign off. I agree. Uh, Lemmy Ward says, what will be the first of the studios to merge? I mean, Paramount just got a, a, a bad notice on itself financially. Uh, I don't know if you guys all saw that, but yeah, I mean, did you read those Poland columns? Did yeah, you read, you read the Poland column and the Rushfield column. I say yes. What, what's your point? I just like <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, about... Yes, Dad. I did the book report, Dad. What do you want? I don't understand what I you're point. The fucking connection there. I fucking want it, but I make the connection. I don't know. This is where Jeff, see, this is the situation. I want to make it clear to everybody here, okay? I'm I do crazy. all the work for this fucking show. I do all the goddamn work. All I ask for this fucker to do is to show up and talk about these topics. That's it. And it's even too much for him sometimes, for God's sakes. Can't you fucking commit? You cry to me about money all the time, and you're barely here half the time. Come on, man. All right, let's hit these Streamlabs. Uh, former Verve floater says, years before COVID, I used to work at the agency Verve. I had a lot of fun there, and I liked Bill Weinstein a lot. Do either of you know the real story as to what's going on there? Because the deadline articles read like hit pieces. Jeff, do you know anything's going on with Verb? Verva? Uh, yeah, I mean it's an it's a semi-interesting story. Uh, mm. You know the, the 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 trades and felony. You know they all love fucking agency drama, right? That is like the top shit that everyone loves to read in this town because we love yeah, watching students yeah. get their comeuppance. Um, Bill Weinstein was the CEO of Verve. He was there 14 years as a founding partner. 
don't know what happened necessarily, but clearly his vision stopped aligning um, mm, with yeah. their uh, partners, uh, Brian Besser and Adam Levine. Right. Um, I think, yeah, I think they just had like different, I think that Bill was really into like growing the agency mm -hmm. and yeah. the others were like, eh, if we could sell this right now and cash out and take 50 million, like we'd probably fucking do it. Yeah. Um, not, I have no idea what Verve is worth, but um, I think that's probably where the, it, it, it came in. And also, you know, like every agency, they're feeling the pinch of the strike, right? Totally. They have a lot of money coming in during uh, the writer's strike because they're primarily a, a lit uh, agency. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, cuts have to be made. And it's like, you know, if this guy has a big salary and you can share his responsibilities with the other founding partners and then the, the managing partner, yeah. Um, then yes, yeah, so, so someone has to go. Uh, it, it sounded like, sounded like it's getting a little ugly and now like Weinstein's trying to get other people from the agency, like lower level right. staffers. Right. I, don't, I don't know that his brother is going anywhere, which is awkward because his brother is, a, is an agent there as well. Adam Weinstein. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, you know, it's something to keep an eye on. Uh, obviously I, I respect anybody who gets tossed from a, a large institution is like, fuck you guys. I'm going to do it on my own. Um, yeah. like, Hey, B Bill Weinstein, give me a call. I'll run communications for you. <laughs> but, uh, or you can call the lady from Lionsgate, you know, but do whatever you want. I guess you could. Uh, Crazy Havana says, minus the $32 million for Phoenix and Gaga, the budget for Joker 2 is still $168 million. That alone is way more than double the budget of its predecessors. How could this even be the case? Many thanks from the UK. Well, Crazy, I think we addressed it. You know, you, you're going to do a bigger scope. It's a sequel. It made a billion dollars. You're going to do a bigger scope of a film. You're going to have bigger production numbers if it's going to be a musical. And you're, and you're not even mentioning Todd Phillips's uh, um, amount. And everyone gets paid off of that. I'm sure all the, the composer, everybody's coming back gets a higher bump for being a part of the other film. So yeah. So what it's $200 million. So what, what if it's great? So what, you know, no one's a billion dollars. It doesn't, it doesn't really no matter. Gonna give a fuck if it makes one, a billion or 1.5. Nobody's going to give a fuck about it. Let's talk about what am I's question. Jeff, would you say that John is a hunk? I would absolutely say John Roke is a hunk. Me? No, <laughs> my days are over, man. I, you know, I'm not a hunk anymore. Look, I was in my, I was in my twenties. Yeah. Please. Got some, some muscles. He's a great kisser. I'll tell you that. <laughs> What what did Empire fans say that got him banned? Uh, he was a cocksucker, is what he was. So I'm not going to oh, back on him. Now. I told you, I told you, I'm very positive. I'm not going to come at people or bull or, or be mad at them or get upset at them. I'm yeah. simply going to block them or mute them, and they can learn their lesson as they see fit. You know, That's Philly. Uh, what? Go Philly one nine zero five seven said, "What's up, guys? I just got a quick question. If Tony Soprano did die at the end of the series, who gave the order to have him whacked, and why?" After all these years, I'm still reading different theories. What do you guys think? That may be the greatest question we've ever gotten on the show. Jeff, who do you think ordered the hit on Tony Soprano if he was killed by the guy in the members only jacket? Johnny Sack's widow. G you think Jeannie Sack ordered the hit on Tony Soprano? I think she asked her for a favor. She can't order hits, but she could be like... She, she could have gone to the New York people and said, you got to take care of this guy. No more fat jokes, fuck face. You're dead. You're dead. Yeah, that's a possibility. I like that idea. I don't I know. Who like you think it. It. Yeah. Um, listen, Empire fan always comes close with his comments, and I've warned him many, many times to not cross lines, to not be a dick. And when he and I told him, hey, you're going to get in trouble. Uh, and sure enough, you know, you, you can only go so to be a cocksucker. <laughs> hey, that's, just, that's just saying hello to me. Mr. Orion says, love your stream, guys. Thank you for the content. Any tips on the crow? Well, I think, Jeff, you spoke about that already. So anything more to add on what you've heard about the crow? I mean, just that, like, the henchmen weren't, obviously weren't nearly as, like, memorable mm -hmm. as the first film. And they, I even think that the henchmen in the second movie aren't bad. Like, Iggy Pop is one of the guys yeah. uh, in, in the crow, too. So yeah. I just think that, those, that this new crew doesn't necessarily stand out. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see here. All right. Uh, just wondering. Okay, Anthony V says, now that you both saw Dune 2, what awards do you think it's, it gets nominated for at the 2025 Oscars? I'm thinking, obviously, all the technical awards, but do you see any acting nominations, or does it really depend on the competition over the next year? Well, it always depends on the competition, but, Jeff, uh, yeah, I finally saw it. Uh, let's talk about it real quick. What do you think it would get nominated for at this point um, as you look at uh, the film? And you wrote a nice review in your in your uh, newsletter as well. Everything I think it'll be nominated for. 
Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Best picture. Uh, I think Austin Butler, but I also think Javier Bardem did a fucking fantastic job in that movie and he should be looked at for best supporting actor. Um, and I thought, um, uh, I thought Zendaya did a really nice job with it as well. And Rebecca Ferguson, they gave her a lot of room to do the things that she did in that film. I thought were fantastic. Look, this thing, I, as much as I love the first one, this one went even higher in terms of, uh, the level uh, of, um, of excellence that's involved in that movie. So highly, highly recommend Jeff. I got to take one more quick break for the uh, thing. And then we'll be back to finish up these questions right after this. I know you're running out of energy, so let's finish off these last ones. Well, yeah, I, I I thought Austin Butler uh, was also fantastic. I do think he'll get a supporting nod, depending on how things break. And I, I do think mm. Zendaya could be in the mix for a supporting nod. That's the thing. You'd have to campaign her as supporting. Right. No, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Timmy would be a – I mean, he could, mm. yeah, but I think it's a struggle to get that kind of role, best actor. But they should they should campaign for him. I just – don't know that'll happen. He was damn good in the movie. Damn good. Way better than the first movie. Way better. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Matt B. Is that Matt Baloney? He says, just wondering if you happen to see the trailer for Snack Shack. I saw it after the last show when you guys that were talking about Matt it. Matt Yes. He's asking if we've seen the trailer for Snack Shack. <laughs> I saw it after the last show when you guys were talking about classic raunchy comedies of the 80s. It reminds me of those. I don't even know what Snack Shack is. Did you see the trailer for that, Joe? I'll tell you exactly what it is. Please. I put it in the newsletter. Snack Shack is the new comedy mm -hmm. from Adam Carter Raymeyer, who did Dinner oh. in America, which is a really good movie with Kyle Gallner and mm -hmm. probably the closest thing we've had to an actual cult movie in the last four or five years. Um, yeah. This is one is with Gabe LaBelle, who played Spielberg in The Fable okay. Hands. Okay. And it's yeah, like two kids who just like, you know, go to the local pool and they they bid to run the, the Snack Shack. And they, oh. Be you know their glorious uh, summer, but then they meet a you know a, maybe a lifeguard, a female lifeguard at the pool, and she comes between them. And I think it's going to be wonderful. I really like that writer director Ray Meyer. Okay, He's got like a punk sensibility. It looks like a fun throwback comedy. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it, and so much so that I subscribed to Frosty's Collider newsletter. Oh, I can attend Collider's. So that I could attend the Collider screening. Oh, okay. They're doing a screening of it with a Q&A from Frosty. And it's like, hey, if they're, if they're not, I actually did the Q&A for, for Dinner in America when they uh, when they did those, when they had the premiere or whatever the fuck it was. Nice. So if I don't get to do it, I might as well watch Frosty do the Q&A. Why, though? I can ask better questions than him. Lights, Camera, Super Action says, Pedro is the only arguably bankable actor in... Fantastic Four, doesn't it feel like a Hail Mary to choose the older and lesser known Vanessa Kirby over a post Barbie world famous Margot Robbie? I know her price tag is huge, but it would have felt like an investment. Uh, Jeff, I, I don't I don't think she wanted to do it. So uh, I don't think yeah, why you think yeah. it's like it's not just like Marvel gets to get gets whoever it wants. Right. Yeah. 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 These people have to also want to be in a Marvel movie and deal with that whole machine for the next five to 10 years of their life. She just did it for DC. Yeah. She has a thriving producing career. She can make billion dollar movies without Marvel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's not like Vanessa Kirby. Like we're going to go with Vanessa Kirby over Margot Robbie. Believe me, if they could have gotten Margot Robbie, they would have loved to, <laughs> but she probably cost too much. And, you know, well, I also think Vanessa Kirby is the investment. It, it, the investment can be financial or you're investing in the fact that this uh, woman who's bringing an incredible amount of talent and skill to the role is going to elevate your film and people are going to be talking about her coming out of the movie, which will get people into the theaters to see it. So in a way, you're investing in her and her talent that can yield you bigger profits down the road than investing in someone who's hot right now. Because I'd like to show you the box office receipts of all those Margot Robbie films before Barbie, and you tell me if that looks like a hot property or not, you know? Um, that Wiccan fan says, nice Young Avengers number one comic in the background. Hell yeah. Do you think we'll actually get a Young Avengers movie slash franchise after Marvel is reducing output? I don't know. I think that's one of those ones that's up in the air because a lot of people aren't necessarily excited about the casting decisions for the Young Avengers overall coming together. I think there's a niche of Marvel fans that are excited about it, but overall, you don't see a lot of people excited about them going into a younger situation. And the report came out this week that Marvel supposedly behind the scenes is struggling because they can't find people to replace 
the charisma and charm and and just scope of uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Chris Evans with the Marvel audience. So I, clearly these young people aren't necessarily grabbing the bull by the reins. So I don't necessarily understand how they think they're going to do a Young Avengers movie at this point right now that's going to make a lot of money. I, I, what do you think, Jeff? I definitely think that Marvel has to revise expectations, not just because they're dealing with a different set of heroes, but yeah, yeah. a different set of movie stars. And there, this is a finite number of movie stars in this town. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people who star in movies. Yes, right. That's a different situation. Right. Le less so real movie stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100% yeah. um, correct. 100% yeah. correct. Uh, let's see. Uh, Parker says, guys, Snyder needs to be on the cinephiles. His chaotic presence would spice things up. Jeff, I love the overalls. You guys are some of my favorites, and I hope to edit for you one day. Uh, yeah, Parker. Um, yeah, Jeff, we've talked about I mean, I don't know if Jeff, Jeff can barely handle two hours on this show. I don't think he can handle a six hour podcast. I don't think that'd be on Jeff's six hour podcast. What do well, you mean? We just, we just did Goodfellas and we broke it up into two parts, two hours each. Three, sorry, three parts, two hours each. That's how, that's how bone deep we go with these films. So I don't know if you'd be willing to sit to do three weeks of a podcast where you dive into uh, sections of the film chronologically over six hours. I don't know if you'd uh, get through that myself. Do we need six hour podcasts? About See? See? Well, if I showed you my numbers and how this, how that podcast funds my life, I think you'd be like, well, I guess we do need that. So, um, uh, Murph, De Murph, 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 says, can I get both of your reviews of the zone of interest? Um, we've talked about it numerous times on the show, but since he paid, do you want to toss out a one minute review of zone of interest there, Jeff? Yeah, I didn't care for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> again, I saw it in, in Toronto before the uh, Israeli Hamas war, which may oh, yeah. have, you know added a different context to it. But um, I don't know. It was just like, I get the point. It was like a two hour, just way too repetitive. I don't know. It, just, it didn't show me anything. It, it was a new approach, but it, 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 I don't know if you're making a Holocaust movie. Like I want some emotion. Hmm. I guess that's the whole point is that there was no emotion. These people were just monsters next door. Um, yeah. I don't know. It, it didn't, it didn't impress me. If you guys liked it, I would definitely recommend um, the son of Saul. Uh, mm. That was much better to me. I haven't seen that. I should see that. Yeah. I like zone of interest a lot. Uh, I thought it was um, a challenging film to watch. I thought, uh, I thought it was the better performance of Sandra Holler between that and anatomy of a fall. Um, and I enjoyed, uh, it isn't the, it isn't the banality of evil. It's the evil of banality. That's what the film explores. I read that somewhere and I was like, that's a perfect description for that movie and how it shows you how people just function as if it's no big deal while they're committing these horrible atrocities next door. And we see that happening in our society today where people are just going about their day, laughing on news shows and whatever, as they're passing policies that are causing the death of numerous people or endangering numerous people's lives uh, and their existence and just laughing along while they do it as they go and see a movie or go and get dinner and not think twice about it. So there's a, the film says a lot more about what's going on in our world as it, as it uh, shows you what was going on back then during that horrible time uh, in the world. And we're going to talk about this on an upcoming episode of the cinephiles. We promise you guys a six hour <laughs> podcast about the zone of interest. Yeah. I think it's yeah. really going to entertain a lot of people. I got 250,000 downloads a week on that podcast, so you can uh, suck my nuts. Holy shit. Yeah, exactly. Haunted Ooh. Autumn says, sorry to come in here with something completely unrelated, but I'm having a really hard day today. I just wanted to say thank you to you guys. I don't know if I'd have gotten through without this. This matters more than you know. Oh, Haunted Jeff. Autumn, I feel you, baby. Dude, you can come to our show as a refuge. You know, like... That's what we're here for, to distract you from the bullshit. Yeah, yeah. Um, we like to have fun. We bust balls. We East Coast boys. That's the game. That's why we started the show. So if we make you laugh, we entertain you, we get you through some tough times. Uh, I'm, as Jeff just said, it's an honor of ours to be able to do so. So thank you, Haunted Autumn, for letting us do that. Take that hat life. off. Let that hair shine, baby. You got a good <laughs> head of hair. Let it flow, son. Appreciate it. Josh Mabry says, John Cena joining OF as his upcoming movie character, Genius Marketing or Awkward. I don't know what that is, OF. Only fans. As oh, <laughs> I think it's Genius Marketing. Cena's upgrade. What is his upcoming movie? 
Uh, oh, what is it? Um, I thought it was for the Peacemaker thing, but if it's a uh, movie, let's see. I have no idea. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, okay. Ricky's oh, Nikki. oh, Ricky Stanicki, right? Yeah. Dude, that Ricky trailer looks great, dude. I've been following that project for so fucking long. <laughs> That trailer looked fantastic. I'm totally in for that movie. Because it's a good idea. That's the sort of high mm. concept comedy idea that, again, w was probably written 10, 12 years ago when high concept comedies were a thing. Yeah. Then, it get put, then it gets put in a drawer, right? Because a hot, high concept is out. Yeah. And now we're coming back around to that, I feel like. Yeah, true. Last two questions here. Haskell420 says, hey, thoughts on BuzzFeed buying Complex for $106 million. Jeff, it wasn't that long ago that we were owned by Complex when we were working at Collider. Uh, so uh, what are your thoughts on this? BuzzFeed buying Complex for under six. From what I understand, they're going to lay off a bunch of people from Complex as well, which is a shame. Uh, any thoughts on this? Is that what happened today? Hmm. That's not... Yeah. I thought Network acquired Complex. But they sold them. They sold them, right? Complex? I don't... I have no idea. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know what to think about it? I mean, complex, like when I thought about complex before, you would be in the context of Collider and, and entertainment news and stuff. Right. Like, Sorry, network. BuzzFeed did sell complex for 108 million to network and e commerce. Right. Company. Network. Right. That's, see, that's, that was, that's yeah. what was throwing me off. Yeah, Ed, you got that wrong there, buddy. So I, I like Jamie Iovine. Yeah. Uh, Jim, Jimmy Iovine's son. Yeah. Uh, I just, I like him. He's a big wrestling guy. You should, I feel like you should know him, Roka. I do know him through Ryan Satin. Him and Satin hosted that podcast for many years. And so I would oh, sometimes, no. yeah, I would guest on the show every once in a while when it was at Collider. Hey, Jamie's old, a cool guy. Our yeah. old, I like Jamie. But yeah, our old yeah. pal, Ryan Satin. Wow, I haven't heard that name in a while. Yeah, Ryan's writing stuff now. He's moved away from wrestling. He's no longer hosting anything wrestling related. He's writing uh, scripts now. He's kind of following in his father's footsteps after his father passed away. So I think it's awesome that Ryan's kind of making this change and, he said he just got tired of helping other uh, promoting other people's dreams and he wanted to make his own dreams come true. And so I'm a big fan of Ryan. I can get behind that. that. Yep, absolutely. Uh, let's see here. One last one. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. BuzzFeed is laying off 16% of its remaining workforce after the sale and expects it will save the company $23 million annual, annually. It's a so, terrible time right now. And, and it's yeah. because, you know, all these venture capital firms and fucking places have, have taken over media. And media was like... Yeah. These are just saw dollar signs in their eyes and sold to these rich douchebags. Yeah. And you have all these media executives making so much money as opposed to like the reporters who actually put out the material that people are clicking on. I yeah. mean, when I found out that John Bing was a former variety reporter, he went into communications. Yeah. John Bing got paid $640,000 as the head of comms for Vice. Yeah. Does Vice not think that they can find a head of comms for two hundred thousand or two hundred fifty thousand dollars? Why do you have to pay somebody six hundred fifty thousand dollars? Could finance all fucking newsroom for a year for that money. That's true. It's really fucking crazy how everyone just has their hands out. Yeah. Except for journalists who are the ones making the fucking money, making the product. True. True. I mean, look at. You know, I bet you, I mean, this is, I'm sure this is true at the trades and I get yeah. it. Like these are the, the ad people make the money, right? But the ad people couldn't make the money without the writers. And yet the ad people probably are making a lot more than the average reporter ever write. Yeah. Yeah. The whole fucking system is totally backwards. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, Spartan 119 says, you guys are the best. How much will Dune 2 make opening weekend? And Jeff, do you think Chiefs can do a Super Bowl three-peat? Beetlejuice 2 news. Thanks. Um, I think the only Beetlejuice 2 news we have is that uh, something you said months ago on the show that um, uh, Jenna Ortega is playing the daughter of um, uh, Winona Ryder was uh, confirmed by her. Um, Dune 2 opening weekend? What do you think, Jeff? I think it's making a billion dollars. Do you think I'm crazy? Now that yeah. you've seen it? Uh, I don't know. If, I mean, it's within the realm of possibility. Um, yeah. But I think it may be too... Hard sci-fi to crack a billion. So I'm going to say. Opening weekend. What do you got? 88 to 92 million. Ooh. Okay. All right. It's tracking at 85 with the possibility of 100. Yeah. I swear I had not seen a tracking number when I selected that. Number, That's so. fair. 
I say 150 from word of mouth. I say 150. 150 opening weekend? Okay. Yeah, from word of mouth. Uh, Haunted Adam says, this is for the community. So many of you, you know who you are. Thank you for being you and for being here. And thanks again to you two, John and Jeff, for creating the space. Much love. There we go, Jeff. Thank you, Haunted. There you go. Thank you, Haunted. Appreciate it. Um, all right. I think that's everything. I missed your stream lab, Fred. Did I? I don't see your stream lab, Fred. Maybe you didn't send it in. Uh, right. You got a whole bunch of these. Uh, yeah. I don't. Oh, Fred. Oh, sorry. Starred comments. There's like 35 right. comments. You're right, Fred. Showing some love for my show and Jeff's Beverly Hillbillies vibe he's got going on. Also, is there any Star Trek news? Thought I'd switch it up there instead of asking about Star Wars. Uh, thank you, Fred, for uh, making sure I read that. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, any Star Trek news? Even though you're not a big Star Trek fan, do you have any news for Star Trek? No. Okay. All right. Um, Princess Posit, how much dollars for Jeff to guest on Geek Buddies? Uh, probably 500. I think 500 would be good to get Jeff on the show. For who? Do you uh, get 500 well, or do I, I get 500? I pitch the number. I'll get 90% of that and you get the rest. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Let's get on out of here. Thank you all so much for hanging out with us. We appreciate it badly. You guys are wonderful. Thanks for all the stream labs, the super chats. Thanks for the lively chat. Uh, 600 of you still, or 550 of you rather still in here. Please make sure you hit a like on the video, share it on your social media, subscribe to the channel down below. And if you want to take clips out and put them up to help promote the show even more, feel free to do that on your own volition. We would love to have that. Uh, Jeff, uh, uh, any, uh, let people know where they can find you and your work that's coming up here. The insnider.com tonight. Tune in because we're going to be breaking some DC news. I think DC news there all right nice as for me at the roca says twitter instagram and tiktok the outlaw nation on twitch don't forget we dropped the new episode of geek buddies earlier today we'll have an episode of jedi way out tomorrow and uh maybe i'll do a watch along of the um of the sag awards on sunday so look for announcements on that um all right y'all take care of yourselves be well have a great weekend and we'll talk to you next time with another brand new episode here of the hot mic peace <laughs>